Looks like we've got about 75 participants, so we'll get started in just a minute. A couple other bits of housekeeping. Please note that this briefing is aimed at supporting green crab information sharing, coordination, and ongoing collaboration around European green crab management in the Salish Sea. The Department of Fish and Wildlife has held a number of similar discussions in recent weeks with co-manager tribes, with federal agencies and partners, and with our fellow state agencies. And if you feel like you would like a follow-up discussion with your group after today's event, please feel free to contact Chelsea. And again, if we don't get to your question during the session today, please follow up with us and either Chelsea, Alan, Ron, or I will be sure to get your question answered. Now you should be able to see the agenda today. We're gonna to have an introduction to the structural landscape around European green crab management from Chelsea. Got a couple other presentations from Bobby and Emily and Sean at UW. And we'll have a quick break followed by an update from Alan on European green crab management actions and emergency measures funding requests. And then I'll, I'll coordinate a quick discussion around European green crab communications, community outreach and engagement and public reporting plans for this year, followed by the Q&A panel discussion at the end. And again, please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A, we'll be monitoring that closely. And I think we're just about ready to get started. Looks like we. So I'm going to turn it over to Chelsea now. I'll stop screen sharing, and Chelsea, you're ready to take it away. And again, if you have any questions or concerns or issues on your end, please feel free to just put them in the Q and A, and we'll handle it from there. All right, let's see, do I have the correct screen up? Yes, you do, I can see it. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, good evening, or afternoon, everybody. My name is Chelsea Buffington and I work with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife in the Aquatic Invasive Species Unit and I am the Green Crab Lead for the state. Um, so what are we talking about today? So we're talking about the infamous green crab. In the state of Washington, green crab are a prohibited level one species. Uh, species in this classification pose a high invasive risk and are a priority for prevent preventative and rapid response management actions. Um, a lot of people ask, what are the goals of managing green crab and who does what? Um, our goals are to prevent introduction of new, control the spread of an impact of existing, and eradicate locally established green crabs wherever possible. We do this to protect our native ecosystems as well as our environmental, economic, and human resources. Uh, we, have, oops, we have six main objectives. Collaboration. You're gonna hear me say this a few more times, but green crab know no boundaries and we must collaboratively manage responses. Prevention is the first line of defense against invasives, and in the long run, it is much cheaper to prevent introduction versus eradication. Early detection, it's easier to manage any invasive at its introduction point. And rapid response, it is important to respond as quickly as possible to an introduction to eradicate or reduce the population right from the start. Uh, oops, it's not going. Control. If all else has failed, control efforts must be implemented to keep populations at manageable levels to reduce or eliminate harm to our habitats and resources. And lastly, research. Research is important because it allows us to adapt our management strategies as more is discovered. At times, the management of green crab within the state of Washington can seem a bit confusing especially since our shorelines, which stretch more than 3,000 miles, encompass so many different jurisdictions, including local governments, different state agencies, federal agencies, tribal governments, and not to mention various private landowners and land managers. We have to remember, like I said before, that green crab know no boundaries and management will, will require collaboration and coordination and action between all parties. In the state of Washington, 
The Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife is the lead for the state and is charged with planning, coordinating, and leading the implementation of management actions. Our Aquatic Invasive Species Program is in turn responsible for preventing the introduction of aquatic invasive species and controlling or eradicating, when attainable, established invasive populations. Tribes and federal agencies are the leads for management in their jurisdictions, and the department provides assistance and consultation when requested. <clears throat> in these photos, we have our partners listed, uh, some of our partners that we've worked with in the past, Macaw, Lemmy Nation, Shoalwater, uh, and then we have the two different U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services that we've worked with up at Dungeness Spit and Grace Harbor area. WDFW designated uh, Washington Sea Grant as the lead for early detection citizen science program uh, known as CRAB Team. CRAB Team was launched in 2015 to fulfill the DFW mandate to monitor for green crabs along inland Washington shorelines. In 2020, uh, CRAB Team expanded to the outer coast and was implemented um, and had implemented sentinel sites, which are comparable to the inland CRAB Team sites. <clears throat> Uh, crab team has two main goals, to detect green crab at the earliest possible stage of invasion to increase the ability to control the population and reduce green crab impacts. They also um, build, use this network to build a long-term data set on green crab and other organisms living in soft sediment habitats to improve the understanding of Washington's pocket estuaries salt, and salt marshes, as well as track green crab impacts over time. Early detection and systematically tracking the relative abundance of green crabs is vital for management. It increases our ability to assess, control, and reduce impacts of green crabs. Stugant has been a crucial partner to management with their scientific expertise, advice, partner capacity building, coordinating volunteers, and even boots in the mud. As green crab numbers have increased and geographical range has expanded, we have been approached by, advocate for, and collaborate with local government agencies, shellfish growers, nonprofit organizations, and any other entities that have interest in, ability to, and resources for implementing removal management actions. We want to empower others to work alongside us and collaborate with us, but we definitely need to have policies and management plans in place so we're able to follow some sort of structure that allows for us all to work towards our shared goals, share resources, and also keep open lines of communication so we know we're not duplicating efforts or doing something that really might not have been the most effective use of time and resources. Alan will actually speak more to this later, but the department has requested funds to support local organizations. We currently only have one developed collaborative management plan, the Salish Sea Transboundary Action Plan. This plan was developed through funding provided by Puget Sound Partnership, and its purpose is to establish and implement a coordinated and collaborative response to incursions of green crab within the shared waters of the Salish Sea. This plan may be used as a guideline as we discuss development of future management plans. Some of our gaps include state policy coordination, a statewide management plan, a green crab task force, which can be divided into two set specific branches, one with focus in the Salish Sea and one with focus on the outer coast. Again, Alan will be speaking more to this later this evening. <clears throat> Just to reiterate from earlier, green crab know no boundaries. And we have miles upon miles of shoreline that fall within the jurisdictions of private landowners and local governments and state and federal and tribal management. For the management of green crab, Coordinated and collaborative efforts are critical, and we know more partnerships and boots in the mud are needed, and there are people out there wanting to get involved in the removal of green crab, and we want to enable them to do so. We are working towards building capacity for local management. Uh, as great as it would be to just let everyone go out and get their feet or hands or knees dirty in the mud, we have to put on the brakes and build a framework for that capacity building. We want to make sure you all have um, that we all have all the tools we need to get started, whether that's appropriate trainings, obtaining the right permits, designing trapping strategies, getting gear and equipment, or even some assistance with boots in the mud once in a while. I also want to break up a bring up a reminder of goals from earlier. We are doing these efforts to prevent and control the introduction, control the spread and impact of existing 
and eradicate locally established green crab wherever possible. We do this to protect our native ecosystems as well as our environmental, economic, and human resources. <clears throat> We are committed to the development of a framework that is not only safe for people and non-target species, but also effective in terms of others' valuable time and resources. As a department, we want and need to develop a pathway that allows partners to get started in a way that brings them up to speed with ongoing efforts, allows for collaborative coordinated management strategies, and provides open lines of communication. <clears throat> this slide highlights some of those key components of getting started. Uh, roles and responsibilities. As a partner, co-manager, stakeholder, or even a private landowner, it is important to have a clear understanding of what your roles and responsibilities will be. Are you wanting to volunteer or contribute to the crab team monthly monitoring programs? Are you doing independent early detection monitoring? Are you wanting to start trapping um, efforts for control or removal? Or maybe you have land that you would like someone else to come and assess. Uh, sorry. Next step would be to reach out uh, to us to get consultation on best practices and development of a trapping strategy that fits your particular location and capacity. This step is really important because coordinating efforts helps to ensure everyone is on the same page and collecting valuable information that can be widely shared. And that's really big key for us that we can share data um, across the board. After that, depending on the location and needs, correct permits and other documentation such as MOUs must be obtained. Uh, we actually have a green crab AIS permit that's required for trapping on state lands. Uh, and we, we do have several partners that have obtained that um, in the past. And we're asking that if an organization is interested in conducting green crab trapping efforts in any sorts to please contact, contact us directly to start a conversation. As we move forward, we hope to provide others with more rigorous training materials. Trainings will range from species identification, trapping protocols and best practices, data collection methods, and more. It's important for everyone to have the knowledge and skills they need before getting out into the field. And lastly, one of our big requirements for partners is data sharing. Data collection not only allows us to track the invasion, but it helps to inform uh, management on removal efforts and trapping approaches. Green crab follows an adaptive management-based approach, and we are always learning and improving our management strategies. So real-time data is extremely uh, crucial. Oops, and that's all I have right now. So I went a little bit faster than I thought, but we can open it up to questions. Chelsea, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat, but if anyone has anything, please feel the drop. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Thank you, Margaret. Chelsea, are you able to see that all right, or do you, do you want me to read it off? Yeah, I'm getting it. I'm also muting my dogs right now. <laughs> so, sorry about that. No problem. Well, thank you, Margaret, for jumping in with our first question. Again, encourage folks to use that Q&A feature throughout the presentations and then also during the panel discussion later. And Margaret's question is, is there a green crab habitat map that would show areas that would be a priority for sampling? I know we'll get a into that topic a little more later, but Chelsea, do you wanna take a stab at it now? Yeah, and I, I think Sea Grant can add to this question too. Um, there are, the Washington Sea Grant's crab team, they have a monthly monitoring site uh, that site map on their webpage that you can follow, get to and see all the different um, locations for their monthly monitoring sites. And those sites within the Salish Sea have been designated a higher priority based off of the habitat. Um, other than that, I don't know of any other maps currently, but we are working towards getting more maps provided to everybody. All right, well, I'm not seeing any additional questions. I think we might be able to move along to the next presentation. But again, if you've got, um, 
we did, we did just get one question about what we see as our biggest challenge. And I know that's going to be one of the lead offs to the panel discussion later. Um, Chelsea, do you want to just take a quick response to that question about the biggest challenge overall for the Salish Sea region? And then I know we'll dig into that further during the panel discussion. Yeah, I, you know, I think that this can be answered in several different ways. And I think that one of the biggest challenges that I foresee for myself in terms of, you know, I do a lot more um, work with getting boots in the mud and doing a lot more organization and planning for the actual field efforts. And I think that the biggest challenge for myself is that we want to be everywhere and it's hard to um, do that with the resources that we have. So the collaboration and coordination is key and we are um, going towards better routes of that, I think. And I, I believe um, every all the partners that we have have really made that more successful for us. And then Linda asks, um, and we'll just take a couple more before we move on. But again, if we don't get to your question after each presenter, I will be compiling them and helping facilitate those questions for the panel discussion at the end. So please stick around with us. That panel discussion should happen um, right around 415, 420 or so today. Um, but Linda, let's see, Linda asks, how is collaboration being coordinated amongst so many organizations? You know, I'm going to leave that one for later. I think that Alan will be able to discuss that a little bit better in terms of the collaboration coordination that is going in terms of, you know, again, the field operations. Um, there's, oh, depending on where we're going and what we're doing, there's always a large group of people that coordinate um, and meet up per, uh, periodically to discuss the efforts that we're going to be doing. And during the coordination, communications, and outreach discussion, I'm eager to take any input you have on coordination around how do we get the word out about green crabs, how to identify them, different, all the different entities that are involved in research and monitoring and management. So we'll be looking for some feedback in the Q&A at that time. We've got one more question from Ian that maybe we can just um, begin to address right now and then follow up on later around something that we hear a lot, which is does WDFW plan to license fishermen to harvest European green crabs commercially in areas where they exist in large numbers? And, and as we all know, there's some complications there related to Washington Administrative Code for prohibited level one invasive species. At present, it is not legal to retain a live European green crab in this state. Um, Chelsea, how, do you wanna to respond to that one? just in brief at this time, and then we can add a bit more detail later in the agenda. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, you kind of wrapped it up right now. Currently, there's a lot of, um, you know, questions about this. And there's, I think the biggest aspect of this about commercially harvesting green crabs is that they are not always in exactly the right locations for where commercial crabbers are already going. So, and you know, you're touching based on intertidal areas that might be privately land owned. Um, and so it's, it's a bigger discussion. So I think that we'll try to tackle that <laughs> later on today a little bit. Yeah. And Ian, I, I see your follow-up question there. And again, we're gonna dig into this one a little bit further down the agenda. I will make a note of it. And um, it is something that is on our minds as well. So thank you for that question. Please stay tuned. We'll, we'll touch on this topic a bit more throughout the, the proceedings today. All right, All right I'm, yeah, I'm gonna stop sharing and allow Bobby to get in there and our next presenter is Bobby Bazell with the Lummi Nation. Hello, everybody. I'm gonna get my screen sharing. Okay. All right, can everyone see the right screen? Yep, all good, Bobby. Thanks, Chelsea. Hi, everyone. Um, as Chelsea said, my name is Bobby Bizell. I am the European green crab biologist for Lummi Natural Resources. Um, I've been leading the trapping program for the last 
uh, I guess since last July for Lummi Reservation Tidelands. And today I'm gonna give you a brief overview of our effort these last uh, couple years, um, <clears throat> as well as give you up-to-date um, information regarding the sea pond um, uh, and where we are with uh, our disaster. I'm not gonna spend too much time here on this. Um, I did want to uh, recognize, you know, the threat of European green crab as they currently stand um, for the Lummi Reservation. There's, uh, of, of course, a lot of concern about uh, shellfish, um, which is relevant to Lummi as well, but uh, just some Lummi specific concerns uh, are with uh, the Dungeness crab harvest. Um, we are aware that um, Dungeness pose a threat through um, green crab pose a threat with com competition, predation on juvenile Dungeness, as well as habitat destruction. Um, for the Dungeness crab fishery, uh, this makes up more than 80% of Lummi fisher income, um, especially in the most re recent of years. So this is particularly concerning. There's the shellfish harvest, as I already mentioned, and then European green crab, um, of course, have could seriously bring down consequences for uh, the near shore areas and native ecosystems. So native species beyond um, those that are harvested, but also to eelgrass beds. Many of you know that uh, research has shown that green crab in very large numbers can completely destroy eelgrass beds. And this is important habitat for many species. Um, especially juvenile salmon. And I, although European green crab are, um, a, you know, a, a significant concern, uh, Lummi is also dealing with another disaster uh, with the Chinook die off from last September. So um, this is just one more layer to the things that are um, impacting the reservation tidelands and um, things that we're going to have to be um, staying on for the next several years. Here's an overview of Lummi Reservation Tidelands. Uh, Lummi Tidelands and Shoreline contain roughly 11,000 acres of near short habitat. And this is characterized by expansive tidal flats. We have Lummi Bay to the north of the Lummi Peninsula here and then the Nooksack uh, estuary to the south um, of the peninsula. This shoreline is, um, has plenty of salt banks. So this is ample green crab habitat. Um, lots to go around for them, unfortunately. Within the 11,000 acres of near shore area is a 750 acre man-made aquaculture pond that was built into the shoreline of Lummi Bay. And it also contains a, a three mile long dike row that encompasses this shallow body of water. The depth reaches no, no deeper than five to six feet. Uh, and these, this water level is buffered by several tide gates to the north and south. Here's a, a snapshot of inside the sea pond and what that habitat looks like. This is in the northern to northeastern portion of the sea pond. Uh, it's mainly that salt marsh with eroding banks, uh, generally shallow intertidal. The bottom habitat is sand and mud. Uh, there is some eelgrass habitat that varies through the year. And then during extreme low tides and high temperatures, especially in the summertime, more of this shoreline will become more exposed. But otherwise, this entire uh, shoreline stays submerged underwater for most of the year. So um, tides tend to not impact our ability to trap uh, by foot in this area. 
In contrast to the marshy zone is that three mile long dike road. So all along uh, the Western and Southern ends, there is some slightly deeper habitat um, that's bordered by this wall of rocks and boulders. Um, even out this way, it's still uniformly mud, sand. Um, yeah, and so after looking at this, the, the wall here, you could walk out maybe just a few several feet and then there is a, a bit of a drop off there so while we can trap um, by foot all along this wall um, otherwise a little further out is uh, fairly inaccessible trapping methods uh, on lummy reservation generally follow those of the protocols laid out by washington sea grant um, so alternating the placement of fukuis in minnows along uh, a shoreline transect. And uh, many of you probably are familiar with these different trap types, but I'll just review them really quickly. Uh, there's the minnow or crayfish trap, has the two openings, slightly smaller, it is, it is uh, stackable. The fukui, which is collapsible, also has two different uh, openings. Uh, and then just this past year, uh, so in addition to the min minnows and fukuis, we began using uh, the shrimp traps, which are a rectangular box-like trap, four tunnel openings, uh, a bait cage in the middle of it. Um, yeah, and we've been finding that these are uh, very effective with capturing green crab. <clears throat> Looking back, uh, just a quick review of the first detection of green crab um, on Lummi Reservation tidelands. So trapping first began in October through November in 2019. There were several locations trapped within Lummi Bay and Portage Bay. Um, so here we have the sea pond. Uh, this is the whole of Lummi Bay here. Uh, there were 23 green crab captured at this location here, which we call Sandy Point Heights. So there's a tide gate there um, that borders the bay and uh, Lummi River, or one of the branches there. And so on the bay side of that tide gate, there were 23 green crab captured in 2019. Down at the sea pond in this northernmost corner, there were 41 green crab captures, so fairly fairly high um, for a first detection. Uh, these other locations you see were also trapped in 2019, but did not result in green crab captures, um, as well as for Portage Bay, which is not shown on this map, but if you look at this inset, it'd be uh, just off of here, off the Lummi Peninsula. In response to this first detection in January of 2020, the Lummi Indian Business Council passed Tribal Resolution 2020-032, which declared uh, European green crab a threat to Lummi um, Reservation Tidelands. And this paved the way for LNR to uh, take take measures, um, not only internally, but also began collaborations outside of LNR with external agencies to begin trapping in mass on the tidelands. So in 2020, between April and November, uh, they did have a full trapping season. Um, most of that effort was allocated towards Lummi Sea Pond. There was some uh, trapping here at Sandy Point Heights, as well as in Onion Bay, which is the this north zone of Lummi Bay. Um, and the with those efforts, there was roughly 2,500 green crab pulled from Lummi Sea Pond, but only seven green crab were captured at that uh, original location at Sandy Point Heights. Looking back at 2021, most pretty much all of the green crab trapping effort was located within the sea pond. Here we just have a graph of um, the trapping month and then the effort, so the number of trap sets um, um, per day. 
So over the course of the season, it was relatively low effort towards the first part of this season. Um, we definitely were uh, working on building capacity at that time, uh, acquiring more staffing such as myself. Um, so between April and July, relatively low number of trap sets. Um, and then after July, uh, the green crab team within LNR was hired, which included myself, a biologist, and two technicians. We also had a couple of others help us um, during the first part of our hiring. And then we began weekly trapping within the Lummi Sea Pond. Um, it was also during July and August, we procured 170 shrimp traps and we're ready, we're readying those and gradually adding those to the sea pond over the course of a couple of months. Then uh, September hit and we had a, a full, um, we were putting a lot of more, lot more people into it, which I'll get to in just a second. Here's an, uh, again a map of the sea pond just to give you some perspective for how trapping worked in the sea pond. Uh, trap placement was generally around the inside perimeter, uh, which we've coined the term wall of depth with our uh, wall of depth with the shrimp traps. Um, so they were placed anywhere from about 50 to 100 feet apart from each other. Um, and then this northern zone up here, uh, the marshy shoreline is where the minnows and fukuis were set. Uh, and we were setting, setting anywhere from 100 to more than 200 traps um, in any given week during the height of the tra trapping. We also did some testing transects uh, in the middle of the sea pond uh, when Fish and Wildlife came and helped us out earlier uh, back in, um, this was, I think, in October. So we did uh, try some trapping in the middle of the sea pond as well. This is a graph giving the mean catch rate, so a number of green crab per 100 trap sets, and then each of the check dates for the traps. Uh, all of the, the CPUE data has been standardized for a single soak night. So just one, one night soak is a single trap set. Um, so I have the, each trap type is separated out here. Uh, we have the fakuis and minnows, as I was explaining earlier, between April and July it was mainly uh, those two trap types being used. And then come July, uh, we began using those shrimp traps and adding those on as uh, in the next, the following weeks. We noticed as we started adding in more and we were doing our weekly trapping, the catch rates for all trap types began to rapidly increase. Um, and this was mainly observed in the young of year cohort um, that was being trapped in that marshy zone. So the smallest crabs were being trapped along that marshy shoreline. And um, as we were, so as we were adding in more and more traps, um, increasing effort, the catch rates also increased. By September, we um, had <clears throat> more than 170 strip traps in the water. Um, and then we also had the help of five to six staff from Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, Washington Sea Grant, as well as Northwest Straits Commission. This was a call to all hands on deck to help us with this rapid increase. Um, now I'll also mention that this is fairly typical for the highest catch rates to be um, in September um, of any given year. So uh, the response was um, uh, mirroring that of the catch rates increasing. And then as the time went on, our uh, staff became more limited um, after November, um, and we continued to do some trapping here and there just to keep a finger on the pulse of what was going on during uh, the colder part of the year. And I'll get into uh, the winter trapping here too in just a second. 
as I mentioned, we did uh, trapping in the middle, and I just wanted to give um, uh, a little bit of a glimpse into what trapping looked like back in October when we had boats in the sea pond. So uh, again, here's a map of the, the sea pond. And then for each of these dots, uh, the yellow or the orange is a shrimp trap. Um, this is data between two different days within October. And the larger the circle, the greater the catch rate for that single trap. Um, these largest circles are up to about 85 green crab. So those were some pretty high catch rates for just a single trap. And this overall just gives you a good view of that green crab are distributed throughout the entire sea pond. There's not really a single location where, where you won't find them. Now, as we've continued trapping through uh, the winter time, the catch rates have dropped off significantly. They're back to what we originally saw um, with the first uh, six months of trapping or so. Uh, but one thing is for sure is that we're catching a lot more of these gravid females or the egg bearing females. Um, with just the handful of shrimp traps that have been checked, there's been, um, com compared to the year before anyways, um, there's been more than a hundred of these uh, egg bearing females. <clears throat> And I'll mention too that these are traps that had been soaking for days, weeks, um, even a couple of months. Um, so our shrimp traps remain in the sea pond. Um, and that's been to somewhat of a benefit with catching these. Um, so there's, there's some trade-offs there, which we can talk about more later if there's time. This is just a side-by-side -side comparison from year to year. Um, here in, in this table is just the Fukui and minnow trap data. So in 2019, 41 captures in, sea, in the sea pond, 48 trap sets, uh, mean CPUE of 85 per 100 trap sets. And then the peak mean weekly was 162, so uh, nearly twice that. Again, 2019, trapping was only conducted between October and November, so pretty limited window there, um, but at, at the very least providing some kind of baseline to compare uh, with the next year's. In 2020, that effort ramped up significantly uh, for the full season. Uh, green crab captured 20, nearly 2,500. The mean for that whole year was 91. But peak, uh, peak mean weekly CPUE was 226. Last year, 15,000 green crab, over 15,000, uh, were captured in fukuis and minnows alone. And then um, 8,300 trap sets, uh, 180 for the mean, and peak was 387. So each year, it's just, it's just been a big spike. Um, rapid increase. I separated out the shrimp trap data. Uh, so this is, this is where we saw the really big catches. Um, so 70,000 green crab, more than 4,000 single night trap sets, um, gives us a mean of 1,001, and then a peak mean weekly of 1,800. Uh, again, a lot of variation uh, with single trap sets, but this still gives us such a, a good understanding that um, you know, this, the shrimp traps are highly effective. <clears throat> so last November, in response to this rapid increase, the Lummi Indian Business Council passed Tribal Resolution 2021-158, and this declared European green crab a disaster and established the European Green Crab Task Force. The task force consists of council and policy um, from LIBC, as well as the LNR director, deputy directors, myself, um, and other folks internally with LNR, um, also including our shellfish hatchery uh, managers. As we continue on, um, and with this declaration, this is still setting the pace for us to 
to continue collaborations and develop new partnerships with Fish and Wildlife, Sea Grant, um, Northwest Straits Commission, uh, as well as federal agencies, Northwest Indian College. Uh, so hoping to bring on um, more folks for research needs in that avenue, as well as Lemmy Fishers and Fish Buyers, which I'll get to in just a moment. So with the task force, we're talking about our response is going to be in two tiers, uh, the short term and the medium to long term response with the sea pond. Um, so in the short term, we're the goal is to reduce the green crab population in the sea pond to lowest possible level. Um, we know that this is trapping is not going to be the long term solution. So with that being said, uh, the task force goal is to develop and implement a comprehensive plan to impede the growth and spread of green crab from Lummi Reservation Tidelands. So in the short term, we're ramping up to do even more trapping this year. We're planning to significantly expand the capacity for removing green crab from the sea pond. Um, there's several different um, ways of doing this or in many things we're going to need to do in preparation. One is uh, acquiring more traps and equipment. We've already purchased another 500 Promar recreational shrimp traps that are in the process of being readied for use. Uh, we've also just um, decided this past week that we're moving forward with building our own shrimp traps. Um, there's definitely a big supply and demand issue with um, purchasing shrimp traps. And so um, we thankfully have been able to figure out a way to build our own. So uh, we're looking forward to getting that and having them ready even sooner. Uh, also with, uh, with building capacity, um, we need additional staff for both administrative and just the trapping later this season. Um, and then, um, it, and with staffing, that also includes um, hiring our, our new aquatic invasive species coordinator who will introduce themselves later. Uh, then we have uh, Lummi Fishers and Fish Buyers. We're planning to contract with Fishers to lead the trapping effort within the sea pond. Um, they'll be utilizing our traps, but um, using their equipment boats in the sea pond to provide uh, round the year trapping effort within the sea pond. Um, and then with, um, oops. And then with uh, fish buyers, they'll be providing logistical support with not only providing bait to fishers, but also um, uh, helping with disposal. Lastly, we need to improve the access to the sea pond with um, a dock that's safe to use, a ramp, um, which needs a little more work, and then um, building up uh, roads and access around the tidelands as well. This is a photo here of in our green crab headquarters um, where we are currently storing our uh, 500 shrimp traps. So lots, lots of work to happen there. In the medium to long term, we are looking to assess the function of Lummi Sea Pond and consider modifications. Um, we're talking about um, doing a hydrological assessment to optimize its use, looking at the bathymetry of the sea pond, um, and then also that, you know, and with these assessments, this might involve with repairing and replacing the sea pond tide gates, which haven't been fully functional for some years. Um, we also need to remove sea pond debris, which is providing some habitat to green crab. We're also talking about experimental methods with mechanical removal of green crab, bottom trawls, small mesh gill net, clam dredge. Um, so just in the works, we are discussing chemical treatment uh, such as rotenone within the sea pond, and then also releasing juvenile salmon within the sea pond, hopefully 
providing um, uh, some kind of predation on the larvae of green crab. Also looking at larvae research and understanding the cycle of green crab larvae in the sea pond and when they might be leaving the sea pond, which might help with um, understanding the settlement in neighboring areas. Overall, when it comes to control of green crab, there really isn't any option off the table at this point. Um, there are certainly some that are being talked about more than others as being viable options, but otherwise, um, there, yeah, there isn't anything just completely off the table. And with that, I'd like to end with um, saying many thanks and appreciation to uh, our LIBC management support and council, our LNR Green Crab team, Fish and Wildlife, Sea Grant, and Northwest Straits Commission, the amount of staffing um, and um, advice that's been helped in the, this uh, rapid response in the last several months has just been phenomenal. And we certainly haven't, we certainly wouldn't be able to do what we did without um, such a collaborative um, approach to this issue. And with that, I think uh, we have some time for questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bobby. It looks like we've got four questions in the chat. Um, I think one of which I'll, I'll continue to save for the panel discussion at the end, but a couple questions specific to your trapping at the sea pond that I'd like to ask since we've got a few minutes. Mm -hmm. um, the first of which is from Erica who asks, did your transects in the middle of the sea pond come up with mini EGC or did you find that they were concentrated along the edges? Yeah, so I, sh I showed that map of um, the, the number of green crab that were trapped in the middle transects. It felt fairly similar with the number that were found in the middle versus out along the sides um, or along the edges. So um, one, there is one thing we noticed though, is the movement of crab or the, the hot spots within the sea pond did kind of change on a week to week basis sometimes. Um, like for example, during when the, the young of the year of 2021 were being able to capture be captured, that was when we saw catch rates in the marshy zone get really uh, quite high. Um, and then that started to dissipate over the next month and shift to um, other parts of the sea pond. So um, yeah, unfortunately, the, the whole of the sea pond, um, you can catch, catch green crab anywhere. So I've got two questions that I'm going to combine just about the purpose of the sea pond. And before I ask these, I just wanna be mm -hmm. clear that the Lummi Sea Pond is on Lummi sovereign lands and supports Lummi tribal treaty rights. And I think there's a couple of folks just asking about the purpose of the sea pond, the goals and values of the sea pond, and then um, what resources were in the sea pond prior to the green crab infestation. Okay, um, maybe I'll start with you know, the purpose of the sea pond. It was built back in the 70s um, with the goal of providing an economic resource uh, for the tribal community um, with shellfish aquaculture, as well as uh, fishnet pens. Um, unfortunately, it didn't quite work out that way in, in the long term. Uh, it now is mainly used as a water supply for the hatcheries that are on the perimeter of the sea pond. Um, there are plans for um, revitalizing it uh, as far as making more use of it in the coming years. So. Um, those are those are still in the works, uh, but there are plans in place to at least utilize it for shellfish aquaculture again, especially oysters, as well as um, uh, using it for uh, local for the salmon hatchery that's also on the the perimeter. We'll be using it as um, um, a, a means of for the the juvenile salmon. Net pen, excuse me. Yeah. 
Thank you. And since we're way ahead of schedule, I've just got a couple more questions for you, Bobby. Mm -hmm. um, both Paul and Russell had asked a question that is on many of our minds, which is, is there any indication of larval escapement from the sea pond or any crab, uh, green crab trap data from immediately outside the sea pond? And I know yeah. um, this is something that multiple partners have been looking into and be curious to hear your thoughts. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned, most of the out, most of the trapping effort was inside the sea pond this year, but we did do a, just a little bit of exploratory right outside of the sea pond. There was a single uh, female green crab caught um, just to the northwest outside of the seawall, um, and that was only over you know, using just a few shrimp traps over a couple of nights. Um, so there's no, there's no way of knowing, you know, for sure if that green crab had just been inside the sea pond or not. Um, but it was at least promising to see it wasn't the same issue as we were seeing inside the sea pond. Um, so I, we know that they're escaping. I'm, I'm sure they are to the amount. It's really hard to say. Um, we know that for larval research, that'll be important for getting a better grasp of that timing of, um, of larvae, larvae reach, um, exiting the sea pond. Um, so lots, lots, of, um, lots of unknowns still, unfortunately. Thank you. I've got two more questions. And, and I know that in the next presentation, Emily Grayson and Sean McDonald from Washington Sea Grant and UW will talk a little bit more about larval distribution. And as many folks on the call today may know, one of the bright spots with green crabs is to this point, they have not been confirmed in Puget Sound proper south of Admiralty Inlet. So that larval distribution is something we're all paying close attention to. And I know that the folks from Sea Grant will talk a little bit more about that during the next presentation. Um, Larissa had asked about the deployment of shrimp pots um, during your catch cycle and just whether they were redeployed in the same locations or whether you were moving the pots around after em emptying and rebaiting. Um, both. Uh, we, we move some of them around. It, it kind of depends on where we want to focus effort. Um, there are so many shrimp pots in the sea pond right now that we can leave them in place, you know, relatively to relative to their original location. Um, yeah, uh, we we move them when we need to. Um, we've actually had quite a bit of issues with. The shrimp traps becoming damaged in the sea pond so they do get moved around because of that as well um yeah and then they're not always redeployed with bait in them too so there there is that to consider okay we had a question from kurt at the port of bellingham about how the crabs are being used or disposed of and i think it's another question that a lot of folks are wondering what we can do with this biomass. And I understand it's something that Lummi has been looking into. Yeah, I mean, when we started catching thousands of them, our freezers filled pretty quick. Um, freeze, freezing is the number one way of uh, euthanizing green crab right now. Um, so right now, uh, well, originally we were just taking them to the landfill, unfortunately. I reached out back when this problem started to a lot of different folks of, you know, if they would be interested in using them. Uh, not a not a great, um, not not a whole lot of interest because uh, most most um, of most people who might be interested in green crab really only want the shells or they just want the meat. Um, and we have no way of processing them for those means. Uh, so we really needed somebody to take them on to like, here, please do something with them. And um, so after some digging, we were able to find one farmer who uh, has been using them or experimenting with them as compost and liquid fertilizer up in Ferndale. Um, so I'm, we're working on that connection still, but I'm hoping that that will be the means of their use for right now um, through composting. Thank you. Uh, we've got two questions about 
um, green crabs and their impacts on other species within the sea pond that I'm going to try to combine here. And, and the mm -hmm. first is just what are the green crabs eating in the sea pond? And then are you seeing any changes in bycatch through your trapping efforts, such as impacts on shore crabs within the sea pond? Yeah, um, unfortunately, we weren't collecting all bycatch data um, this past year because the the priority shifted to just pure removal. Um, so that, that was the focus, uh, especially with, you know, that much trapping that we were doing to document every bycatch would be a lot of paperwork. Um, however, it is something we're interested in seeing, um, in the long term. but at, as you know, the sea pond is, is pretty unique. Um, so it's not, you know, to do a, a study wouldn't be, I think, truly comparable to some places, but yeah, it's kind of hard to say. Um, but more work definitely needs to be done with um, uh, impact studies. And we are looking at baseline surveys for clams and Dungeness. Um, also, what are they eating? Well, there are clams in the sea pond. Um, so I imagine that they're probably eating a lot of those. Uh, there hasn't been any uh, clam harvest within the sea pond for several years. So uh, they're probably chowing down pretty good on those. Thank you for that. I know that Bill Dewey was asking about the impact on manila clams in particular and any, whether there's any evidence of EGC eating them. And I think it's safe to assume that they are. Is there anything else you would add to that? Um, yeah, I think there's still a good bit of unknowns. Um, it is something that we want to prioritize trying to get that baseline. Um, but yeah, it that's going to be a, a shifting of priorities these next few months and starting to think more about that long term. Right now, we've been more, um, at least for the trapping program, focusing on getting those traps ready. But as we dive more um, into conversations with our task force on the long term planning, that's going to be one thing where uh, we seriously look into. Um, and again, I know this is a question that a lot is on a lot of people's minds, and I hope we can address it a bit further down in today's agenda. But is there any additional detail you can share on the compensation for Lummi fishers for their work in EGC removal within the sea pond? Yeah, we're planning to contract. It, it would be a, a business arrangement. So um, I don't have specifics for that right now, but. Um, yeah, that's there will compensation will be part of it, and that is part of our response program um, with state funding is providing um, uh, a means of of bringing in contracted mm -hmm. fishers and fish buyers. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Bobby. Anything else you want to add before we move on to the folks from Washington Sea Grant and UW? Oh, I think I'm good. All right. Chelsea, anything you want to jump in with or should we turn it over? Uh, no, I think that's great. We are definitely ahead of schedule, but um, I will say we're moving into Emily Grayson and Sean McDonald and they, they know how to fill space if we need to. So uh, next up is Emily Grayson with Washington Sea Grant and Sean McDonald from the University of Washington to discuss green crab status for 2022. Thanks so much, Chelsea. Um, can everyone see my slides okay? Yes. Thank you for the confirmation. Great, so hi everyone. Um, my name is Emily Grayson and I'm a marine ecologist and invasion biologist by training. And I am the program lead for CRAB Team, a program that Chelsea talked a little bit about out of Washington Sea Grant at the University of Washington. Um, that works with um, citizen science volunteers to do an early detection and monitoring network, um, as well as working uh, to conduct research on different parts of the green crab invasion so that we can help um, make management as, as smart as possible. And also in terms of building capacity in working with partners and managers around the state to um, 
to, to keep track of the green crab status and, and make sure everybody has the information they need to, to work really hard. So WDFW asked us here today to provide an update on the recent status of green crab populations, as well as our interpretation of patterns across the invasion. So I'm gonna start off this, uh, this section of today's meeting by zooming out from the Lummi Sea Pond to the context of the entire region, the entire Salish Sea region, um, and even a little bit of focus on the entire state of Washington and Pacific Northwest region. Since today's uh, meeting is largely focused on inland shorelines, I'm gonna dive into a little bit more depth on status and trend within the Salish Sea. However, if you're interested in learning more detail about coastal status and trends, I'll be sharing more detail on that region during um, the, the next meeting, which will take place on Thursday. So to provide this info, um, what I wanna take a step back and acknowledge is that I'm gonna be drawing on contributions and data collected from a huge number of partners. Um, these are partners out in the mud, not only conducting trapping work, but also curating and sharing invaluable data um, that enable us to have a really incredible level of detail to evaluate change in green crab populations over space and over time. And this is sort of uniquely beneficial at the early stages, the leading edges of invasion, um, when things are changing really quickly and when we have the best opportunity to intervene effectively. So I do want to acknowledge and thank the folks that have graciously shared all of their data with each other so that we can so that we can continue to have these conversations. Many of these partners are panelists on today's webinar, so you'll have a chance to hear from them as well um, during the Q&A, I, I believe. All right, so to take a step back, uh, to zoom out to the, 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 the range of the state and the region, the governor's uh, recent declaration of a green crab emergency was really based on two alarming trends that the groups here today have been tracking and combating for several years. First, an increase in the abundance of invasive European green crabs, as well as their continued spread into places they pre hadn't previously been found. So sites like Lummi Sea Pond and others that you may have heard about in the news recently absolutely highlight some of the most alarming numbers of green crabs that are emerging from these trends in some cases. And those news items might very well give you the impression that all of Washington shorelines are completely overrun with green crabs. So my goal here today is to clarify these trends and, these, and, and put the patterns in the context of um, the big picture. And then also to provide an update on what we've learned and why we might be concerned. So first, while these trends are truly statewide, um, we also know is that so far in the invasion, they look really different in terms of coastal versus inland geographies. So on average, green crabs are much more abundant where they're found in uh, Pacific coast estuaries, particularly Willapa Bay and Grays Harbor with widespread continuous populations. You don't really find the edge to a population in those locations. By contrast, with the notable exception of Lemmy Sea Pond, green crabs are relatively less abundant where they are found inland. And where we do find them, they're not as widespread across shoreline, but they're more spatially restricted to really the, the top tier habitats in their distributions. Now, there are both historic and biogeographic reasons for this distinction between these two parts of the state. And uh, first, the arrival of green crabs in coastal estuaries predates that uh, of inland waters by nearly two decades. In large part, this earlier arrival is itself in turn due to the fact that the coastal zones are more ex are, are, have a greater exposure to sources of larvae getting washed in from other populations of green crabs outside of Washington state entirely. So we consider that based on where Washington is in the overall process of invasion, we have two distinct but connected invasions that look different and they may warrant different management uh, targets. Now, again, because this meeting is um, focused on inland shorelines, I'm gonna spend more time on detail inland, um, but talk a little bit about more about the coast uh, for, for a reference point. So first, relative abundance. What does this look like across our state? So this map shows the aggregated trapping data from all sites where green crab were found in 2021. 
Each of these green bubble site markers is scaled by the size, is scaled in size by the relative abundance of green crabs that have been trapped at those sites. And as, as you heard sort of Bobby refer to, um, we use um, average capture rate as our metric for relative abundance. And it's typically standardized as the number of crabs that you would catch if you set an average of 100 traps. Now this relative abundance number, it, it's not a perfect proxy for population size, but it's more informative than just looking at the raw number of, the, of crabs captured. So many folks in this meeting have probably heard some, some recent news reports of you know, 70,000, 80,000, more than 100,000 crabs coming you know, from one site or another. Um, and those, those, um, those are certainly good touch points for um, saying, hey, there's a lot of crabs here. But only looking at that raw number of crabs can be a, a little bit confusing because when it comes to trying to compare sites to each other, how many crabs you catch depends not only on the population size, but also in how much trapping you do. So capture rates are one way we account for this. However, we acknowledge that they are still only a rough metric of abundance because especially when we zoom out to the level of the state, we're lumping together different trapping approaches uh, like different gear types. Bobby mentioned a few gear types, different times of year. Um, and depending on how you emphasize and prioritize different trapping activities, um, capture rate can sort of be sensitive to, to that. So we try not to overinterpret small differences uh, between capture rates at at, um, at across sites. But generally, you'll notice from this map that sites that top the scale in Washington, which range from about 300 to 1,000 crabs uh, per 100 trap sets. Um, and these sites are largely concentrated in the coastal estuaries, again, uh, primarily Wilp Bay and Grace Harbor. The top are three of those four sites that I've listed there are in coastal estuaries. And then the Lemme Sea Pond is for us, the only inland site that, that is as nearly high abundance as um, coastal sites. Now, by contrast, nearly all of the sites with green crab present along inland shoreline have very low abundance and even lower abundances than anywhere we see green crabs observed on the coast. So here I've called out just three, um, three sites where in 2021, the capture rates were less than one crab per 100 trap sets, meaning you have to set more than 100 traps to catch even one crab. So really quite low. What about geographic range differences between coast and, and inland? In coastal estuaries, green crabs are observed to be much more widespread across the habitat that's suitable for them. So here to the, that last figure, I've added black dots to every location that was trapped in 2021 where no evidence of green crabs was found. So what this figure highlights is that in coastal estuaries, green crabs can be found nearly everywhere we put traps out for them. And as I mentioned before, you can trap, but you don't really find the edge of a site or the edge of a population of green crabs. While inland green crabs are only detectable at a minority of the sites where we look for them, and of course in, in, in smaller numbers. These are, as Chase mentioned earlier, are primarily concentrated in the northern part of Washington's inland waters, and to date haven't, we haven't found a live adult green crab south of Admiralty Inlet. And this picture is just to um, provide a, a, a visual break, but also to remind folks that while green crabs can survive nearly all of the temperature and salinity conditions in marine waters, on the west coast they tend to do best in these shallow soft sediment habitats that provide some protection from native predators. So when we're looking for green crabs and not finding them, we're looking in the best habitat that we can find um, and still not finding them. Now this pattern inland of restricted range is not occurring just on a regional scale, but it's on a site scale as well. So this is a map of Drayton Harbor. And what I'm showing here in white is the location of all of the traps that have been set in the past two years as a result of removal efforts, which have been uh, conducted by a collaboration of DFW and Northwest Straits Commission. So all of the places in white have been trapped. However, green crabs have only been found in some of those locations. These yellow dots that are superimposed on top show the locations of all of the captures of green crabs in the last two, year, two years. And as you can see, while there is a lot of suitable muddy shoreline habitat in Drayton Harbor that green crabs could theoretically be using based on what we know about their biology, they're really only being found close to shore 
Um, and in these uh, estuary, these creek mouths, or in habitats that provide three-dimensional uh, uh, protective structure. So what we're seeing here, and, and this is, I'm just showing Drayton Harbor as an example, um, but there's a number of other sites across the inland waters where this is also the case. What we're seeing here is that at these relatively low abundances, um, habitat is really important for targeting green crabs. They're really concentrated in the places they have the best survivorship. These, this concentration also offers opportunities for trapping efforts to focus on, on what we might call these hot spots for more efficiently drawing down the population. Now, I wanna point out that this is not, there's not something sort of intrinsic to green crabs going on here. That means that they're restricted forever to these habitats. This is really a function of low density and early stage of invasion. We anticipate that if green crabs were to become more abundant in places like this, that they would spill over in their populations and start to survive better in more open, less protected habitats, including ones like eelgrass, and, eelgrass beds and um, you know, shellfish cultivation habitats. Now, I also wanna point out that these patterns that we observe in Washington are being similarly observed across the border in Canada, where green crabs are actually more abundant and widespread in coastal embayments than along inland shorelines, similar, similar again to Washington. Now, in fact, unlike Washington coastal estuaries, green crabs did uh, establish self-recruiting populations in the fjord-like inlets of the outer coast of Vancouver Island. Like here, I'm showing uh, Barclay Sound and Clayquot Sound. Um, it, during the initial range expansion in the late 1990s. And currently, these populations are not only larger than inland populations uh, uh, in either side of the Salish Sea, but they're also larger than Washington's coastal populations at, at the present time. In fact, um, you may have heard about a very large removal trapping effort out of British Columbia. And there are some folks here um, from the Coastal Restoration Society who are conducting what is actually, I think, one of the first removal trapping efforts that uh, has occurred in Canada. So moving um, from monitoring to actually trying to draw down populations, which is, which is fantastic. Um, and in, in this coastal estuary in particular, they're seeing incredibly high densities um, I think the numbers, hopefully I get this right, from December are, are a, something like 640 trap sets and a capture of 72,000 crabs, which is, you know, for reference, it's an average capture rate of more than 11,000 crabs per 100 trap sets. So um, those, are, those are certainly some astounding numbers. And given that green crabs have been established um, for several decades in that estuary, it, it, it may not be um, sort of entirely surprising. And we hope that um, the, the groups are, are making excellent progress towards um, changing those numbers in the long run. Now, by contrast, many of the inland sites uh, explored by um, Canada, and this is work done by Fisheries and Oceans, by several tribal First Nations, as well as Parks Canada, um, most of these sites turn up no evidence of green crabs. And those that do, there's a few Lady Smith Harbor, Boundary Bay, Esquimalt Lagoon that uh, yielded crabs in 2021, have relatively low numbers, and it looks like green crabs are only recently arriving there. Now, the big exception, of course, is this one large dot, which is in a place called Souk Basin. Some folks might be familiar with that as the first detection site in the Salish Sea where green crabs were uh, first found in 2012. Um, Souk Basin is a really, um, it's, it's a really restricted, isolated, in terms of water exchange, body uh, basin. Um, and all of the evidence indicates that humans actually were responsible for bringing green crabs to souk at that time rather than sort of natural larval dispersal. Um, and, and the retentive um, isolated nature of that body has enabled the population to grow much larger in large part without actually resulting in spread for a long time. Okay, so um, what I want to do here is talk a little bit more about why we see these differences between um, the coastal and inland shorelines. What causes that, that these, these overall trends? Well, as I pointed out at the, at, at the beginning, that it really has to do with um, two things. One is larval dispersal. This is really how green crabs are able to get around 
in our region. And the second is um, the time since first detection is just sort of the, what we call the residence time in, in invasions, how long they have had, uh, how many opportunities they have had to grow their populations. So here I wanna talk a little bit about larval dispersal first. Um, Chase mentioned that you know, this, this is a topic that we're really interested in, in large part because this is understanding how populations connect to each other is critical to how we decide to prioritize things in terms of control. So green crab larvae can spend several months getting washed around on tides and currents. And as I mentioned, this is the main way by which they've actually uh, spread along the West Coast, including making it uh, to most of the inland sites in Washington, not all of them. And um, this is indeed the main way that they have actually spread since their first arrival on the West Coast, first detected in San Francisco Bay in the 19, late 1980s. And after establishing populations there, they spread northward, particularly helped along by really strong northward currents during um, years of high El Nino indices. So arriving in Washington in the late 1990s, um, green crab larvae found that the Strait of Juan de Fuca is actually a, a pretty decent barrier to larvae getting into the Salish Sea. And the reason that this occurs is that due to a lot of the freshwater inputs into the Salish Sea, the, the flow of surface water trends outward. And surface water is, is where you know, green, crab spend, green crab larvae spend most of their time. So with the, the primary flow going outward, it's certainly a tiny, tiny green crab larvae sort of can't fight the upstream, can't do the salmon upstream swimming to overcome, um, overcome that, that surface water exchange. And so the, this makes it really hard for them to get into the Salish Sea. For that, region, for that reason, um, it turns out that Greek crab actually bypassed the Salish Sea during their initial range expansion. They did manage to establish populations, as I mentioned, on the west coast of Vancouver Island and continued spreading northward. Currently, their, their northward um, range limit is Haida Gwaii, where they were first detected in 2020. They haven't yet been confirmed in Alaska. Although there's some folks from Alaska on the call, and I know they are on a sharp lookout because green crabs are basically almost within, um, within eyesight of, uh, of Alaska waters. Um, however, uh, again, uh, green crabs didn't make it into the Salish Sea during the first two, two decades or so. Now that said, all of this, out, this stuff about outward flow and, and natural barriers said, um, we do know that there is occasional weak connectivity between the coastal and inland waters that does enable green crabs to come eastward through the strait. Primarily, this occurs during surface water reversals uh, that are associated with winter storms. And this flow typically happens along the southern portion of the strait. So overall, this big picture, what it means is that because the populations inland are relatively smaller than the coast, and because most of the surface waters um, bring larvae from places like souk primarily outward, that there, there has been some protection of the Salish Sea from larval inundation from these really large coastal populations for, for a long time. Now, this could be starting to shift. And as populations become more widespread and more numerous inland, this, uh, you know, that protection is sort of, at a certain point, it, it could be moot if it gets large enough because, you know, the inland sources themselves may provide um, the, the, the source of larvae. And this is, you know, as, as mentioned during the Q&A um, after Bobby's talk, this is one, one concern about um, a population that could become, you know, really numerous in the Lummi Sea Pond. So a large part of what we want to do is understand if larvae are getting out of the sea pond, where do they go and, and how do we manage for that? So on average, this means that the coast is exposed to larvae from larger populations um, than inland sources. So with respect to larval dispersal, we've already started to see some evidence of these dispersal patterns in ongoing work to track the genetics of, of crabs as they're spreading regionally. And so um, I wanna acknowledge that this is largely work done by in collaboration with Carolyn Tiepold, who's, who's on, um, on the webinar today at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And Carolyn has been able to, to discern that there uh, we can actually see a distinct genetic signature 
from crabs that are living in souk basin. And this genetic signature indicates um, that these crabs were bottlenecked from a coastal population. So we know that they came from our same region, but the fact that they experience such a bottleneck means that we can tell them apart genetically from crabs that are um, coming from coastal sources that here are indicated in yellow. Now, this is an incredibly powerful tool because it means that when we find crabs in different places, we can start to understand the relative influence of Souk Basin, which is a large population as a source, both inland and coastally, uh, versus these coastal populations. We can start to look at what the actual exchange is. And so, so far, what we've seen is that um, we, we can see that crabs from the coast can make their way into inland waters. And, and there are several parts of the Salish Sea that seem to be more associated with, um, uh, with crabs coming from the coast than others. We're gonna, we have sort of a relatively small sample size now, but we're learning more and more every year. Um, and we can also see that there are opportunities for crabs coming from Souk Basin here in green to make it particularly to parts of the um, inland waters that are sort of in Whatcom and Skagit County. We're not only seeing individuals from both Souk and coastal populations, we're also seeing some interbreeding of those two sources um, in, in those areas. Now, um, as they say, the strait runs both ways. And so we also see evidence that green crabs from Souk are getting out of the Salish Sea. And um, we found evidence of them in places like Willapa Bay and even as far south as Central Oregon coast. So currently we see a real need to improve um, our, our predictive abilities when it comes to figuring out where larvae will go from where they are now. And there are a number of folks building some additional oceanographic work to try to understand things like where larvae could go if they are coming out of Lummi Sea Pond or if they're coming out of Souk Basin in large numbers and uh, including um, working with a team at Woods Hole uh, with, with Carolyn. Understanding these dynamics, uh, how the oceanography, both within and across our waterways, connects these populations of green crabs is entirely essential to, to figuring out how we tackle this invasion. All right, so I, I want to provide just a, a few more thoughts on inland waters and what the status and trends are. What are the changes in, in numbers over time tell us about where we might be headed? So this is the catch rate. For all sites within the Salish Sea where green crabs have been detected over the last six, uh, yeah, six years. Um, and I want to point out that this, this figure does not include data from Lummi Sea Pond because the numbers are so much higher there, it would sort of obscure uh, the patterns in um, the range of other sites. So Bobby did a great job providing detail there. Um, and now I want to provide for comparison uh, the story of what's going on at these other sites. Now, this is um, total catch rate. As you can see, it last year um, was hit the max that we've seen so far, which is about 3.5 crabs per 100 trap sets. Now, this doesn't include data from all of the sites where we never detected green crabs. So these, these capture rates are still um, only from places where we did find crabs and they're still quite low. It does show a trend towards increase, but nowhere the dramatic um, exponential increase that have been uh, observed either on the coast, which I'll talk more about on Thursday, or at Lummi Sea Pond. Now, the catch rate in 2021 here is actually, you know, only you know, it's two orders of magnitude lower than um, what Bobby was describing at, at Lummi Sea Pond. Now, what this map also show, uh, shows is green crab presence in 2021, but it's also worth noting that um, since 2016, green crabs have been detected in several locations where we no longer find evidence of them, including the site of the first detection on San Juan Island. Um, we have found a couple of hits here and there since then, but we're not seeing consistent numbers. Additionally, 2021 was the first year where we didn't have any detections in new water bodies along inland shorelines where, where green crabs had been previously detected. Now, another way to, to sort of evaluate what's going on and another general pattern we've observed is that even among the list of sites that we do find from year to year, it's generally been the case that only one or two sites dominate the captures each year within, within the region. That is, most of the sites yield only a small number of crabs and a few sites will have relatively high uh, catch rates. 
So uh, if we look at sites as a percent of all the green crabs captured by year, we can see how the hot spots within the Salish Sea have shifted over time. Um, first year was Padilla Bay with a whopping four crabs, um, and then shifting to Dungeness Spit, with Drayton becoming more important, and recently Samish Bay also appearing as a big contributor to green crab captures outside of, of Blummy Sea Pond within the Salish Sea. So another way to look at this is to look at these temporal trends broken down by site. We can, we can start to get some sort of site level nuance of these places. Outside of Lummi Sea Ponds, again, capture rates have, have remained relatively low over that time period. Um, and here I'm showing you two sites where management groups have been able to conduct large scale trapping each year and have had periodic detections. On the left is Squim Bay in the North uh, Olympic Peninsula. And this is trapping work largely done by Neil Harrington with the Jamestown Slalom Tribe. And on the right is Padilla Bay up in Skagit County. And this is, uh, these are efforts led by uh, Roger Fuller at the Padilla Bay NUR. Um, both of these sites are setting on the order of about a thousand traps over the last year or two. And both sites have shown a slight recent increase, but you'll notice that the, the even um, the higher sites caps out below two crabs per 100 trap sets. So it's cause for sort of attention, um, but we're not seeing the explosions that have been observed at high density sites. On the bottom here, I'm gonna show you two sites where removal trapping efforts are underway. So Dungeness Bay in the North Olympic Peninsula and Drayton Harbor up in Whatcom County are both sites where in the past couple of years, we're talking three to 5,000 trap sets per year and capture rates has, have declined um, in, in both cases. So each of these sites, of course, has different factors operating on it, including different green crab survival rates, population sizes, exposure to larval sources, but it's promising that neither of them have, have uh, uh, skyrocketed to abundances observed elsewhere. Another thing I just quickly wanted to mention, um, Bobby noted some of the seasonal trends that are observed at the Lummi Sea Pond. And I think this is a really interesting thing that we're starting to learn more about. Here I'm showing you um, average catch rate by day of year over four years of tra removal trapping efforts at Dungeness Spit. And what's, what's interesting to me is that this is a really different seasonal pattern than is being observed in some other places where green crabs are at higher densities. Because the peaks are really early in the season, you do in a couple of cases see late season peaks. And those late season peaks are often associated with the arrival of the young of the year cohort. Early season peaks are actually probably associated with, hey, um, we're just encountering crabs that haven't eaten for a long time and they're really motivated to come to traps and we may be able to draw the population down a little bit until the next uh, comes along. But in some sites, the signal of the young of the year appears to be swamping um, the, uh, you know, the adult crabs that are already on site and, and that, it, that may drive the seasonality of these late season peaks and trapping. I mentioned the young of the year um, and, and sort of this idea of cohort strength. By looking at how many young of the year we catch, um, we get an idea of what we might anticipate next year. These are data from 2020, where we uh, measured the size of every single crab that was captured. And if you look at the size of the captures by date, you can start to see that there's a group of crabs that show up in late August. This is our young of the year cohort. And when we quantify the contribution of that cohort to the overall catch of the year, it looks like about 30% or a third of the crabs that were captured were young of the year. Now in 2021, we saw something really different, which was only four young of the year comprising 3%. So this is a big drop in cohort strength from, from one year to the next. It's only two years of data, and this is only one site, but the same general pattern has been observed at a lot of the sites that we've, we've seen, uh, even those with fewer crabs across inland waters, with of course the exception of Lemmy Sea Pond, um, where Bobby just talked about uh, the, how young of the year was really driving that huge increase in, in catch at the end of the season and comprised most of the trap catch. Now, one question that often comes up with green crabs is the question of whether or not we would consider populations to be established at sites like Drayton or Dungeness Spit. Now, when invasion biologists uh, get asked this question, we're, we're really asking is our crabs self-recruiting or locally sustaining? 
This is a slightly different uh, question than do we expect to see crabs here next year? Do we need to set traps for them next year? Um, because at the heart of the difference here is a question about how, uh, what the sources of larvae are that are contributing to a given site. Are the crabs here um, contributing to local population growth or are their larvae being exported to some other location? Or with respect to this site, are outside sources of larvae causing population uh, continuity or growth here locally? And which of those is the strongest influence? Now, this is a subtle difference, but it's not just academic. Um, you know, it can be hard to distinguish these processes from just size, uh, size and date data of crabs like the figures I showed you on, on the last figure. We really need to start looking at things like this genetic data and some of the modeling data to confirm which of these process is, is most influential. But as I mentioned, it's not just an academic question because it decides how we uh, prioritize any response actions that we, that we put in place. Um, and of course, critically, the question of what is the right spatial scale that we're talking about? Are we talking about just Drayton Harbor? Are we talking about the Salish Sea? Or are we talking about Washington State as a whole in terms of um, thinking about establishment? All right, well, I, will, I wanna wrap up and pass it off to Sean, um, but I wanna provide a few parting thoughts on, on prospects um, and, and what you know, we might think are the important points about status and trends. The first thing is that we've observed that local and regional larval pressure on both coastal and inland sites continues to increase. As populations locally grow, there's more larval pressure on uninvaded sites as well as existing sites. And we're seeing populations grow in places like Oregon, meaning that we're going to experience some of, of the um, effects of that. In part because of that, and in part because of uh, the abundance of suitable habitat, green crab populations, both coastally and inland, can get much larger. We see much larger population sizes elsewhere, and we have, we have reached nowhere near what you know, is likely the carrying capacity of our systems. And impacts will grow as those populations do. Right now, within inland waters, numbers are relatively low to the point where we wouldn't expect to see impacts at most sites. Um, when, when grabs are, are as rare as they are, even in places like Drayton Harbor. Um, that said, if we get numbers that are super huge, that's when we're gonna, um, we're certainly going to be seeing ecosystem changes at that point. Now we have also um, expressed some cautious optimism that we have seen some efficacy of population suppression under certain conditions. And I put this qualifier in because we, we don't have control over all of the conditions, um, but we, and we don't know how things are gonna play out in the long run. But I do want to acknowledge that in a couple of sites where we've started with a small population size, where we've put out lots of traps and where we've had some help from nature, both in the form of, of a good, you know, of, of a good larval dispersal year, which for us is a bad larval dispersal year for green crabs, as well as some regional protection from the oceanography, we can see population declines. Um, of course, whether or not those are sustained over time, um, we will only be able to tell in retrospect. And then lastly, control occurs at the local level. We manage crabs in a place to control its impact there, but it also matters on a regional level because crabs, uh, crab populations are connected with each other. So here, I think I'm gonna pause and allow uh, my colleague, Sean, to provide a few thoughts on um, interpretation for management. Great, thank you so much for that, Emily. I really appreciate it. It's always a hard act to follow when you present first, but I will do my absolute best. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And Emily, if you wouldn't mind just letting me know if you can see my the correct view since I won't be able to see you. Right now I see your notes. Perfect. How about, how about now? Now we're good? Yep. All right. Well, thank you everybody for, uh, for being here today and for allowing us an opportunity to speak about uh, the effort so far. Emily's done a great job of uh, ex explaining some of the, the, the status and trends that we've observed, uh, especially over the last year, but really since, since the um, monitoring efforts of uh, crab team have been going on, which is 
now since 2014. My role today is to perhaps provide just a little bit of interpretation of these patterns for management uh, or uh, to lead us towards some management decisions. And I just wanna also preface everything that I'm saying by, by pointing out that uh, WDFW is the lead management agency and uh, works closely with the tribal co-managers um, to make those management decisions. Uh, my role and the role of CRAB team uh, and other uh, scientists is, is really just to provide information and to try and help where we can, uh, providing the ecological and biological context for those management decisions. And as uh, I believe Chelsea mentioned, um, I know we are running a little bit ahead of schedule and I can certainly fill time um, and I'm happy to do that. So I'll try to try to um, entertain as well as inform as I move forward. All right, so the first thing I'd like to do is, is start with this video because as Emily finished her talk, she pointed out that um, it can get worse. And, and I like this video only because I think it does a very good job of demonstrating that um, within the Salish Sea, what we're seeing so far is a relatively low abundance of crabs uh, with very limited, if, if any, uh, impacts in most areas where they've been found. We've, we've, those, those numbers have been very, very low. What you're looking at here is a, a single trap set, a time lapse, if you will, uh, from a place called the Great Marsh in Massachusetts. Uh, this is a trap obviously with a camera. Um, and uh, what you see here is the catch of about 300 crabs over about three hours. And in this particular location, they can put these traps out over and over and over again and get those sorts of catches. So what we see here in uh, the inland waters of Washington State in particular uh, is, uh, is nothing compared to what it could potentially be. And I, I think that um, our, our uh, colleagues, our collaborators on the out, outer coast of uh, Vancouver Island Maybe starting to see some catches that are approaching these numbers in some ways, uh, but certainly within the Sailor Sea, we want to try to keep those numbers down. Um, and I think we've been pretty good, so pretty successful so far. Let me talk a little bit about the Lummi Sea Pond uh, in a little bit as well. So my job today, as I said, is to provide some interpretation relevant to management. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that in order to do this, I just want to make clear the difference between uh, common long term management goals, uh, specific management strategies used to reach these goals, and then finally specific tactics, which can be employed and these tactics are really the tools within a management toolbox and all of this has a biological and ecological context so I want to start with some of those goals. And this, of course, this figure should look very familiar to you. Emily did a great job of explaining some of the differences and similarities between coastal shorelines and inland shorelines as it pertains to European green crab. Um, obviously, there, when we talk about management, we can't think of it as one size fits all uh, because of the distinct differences in the history of the invasion, exposure to um, to larval inputs in many cases, uh, and the oceanographic processes that occur both on coastal shorelines and in the inland shorelines. So uh, typically when we think about management goals in this situation, uh, we typically think about these three major management goals, preventing additional invasions, eliminating or eradicating green crab, and of course, uh, when perhaps that the first two are not possible, uh, reducing ecological impact and economic harm. Um, you know, I, I think it's important to point out, as Emily already has, that over the last five years or so, green crabs have become more abundant, both the Salish Sea and on the outer coast, uh, and you know, in some ways, are perhaps poised to become more abundant. Um, they're also much more widespread than uh, previously recorded. So. Management, there is some urgency around management and management efforts. And so I'm hoping that, that what I shared with you today can be useful. So uh, this is also a figure that should look really, uh, 
really obvious and, and very familiar since Emily just shared it. Uh, there's our three management goals, large, broad goals there. I want to highlight once again the efforts of our collaborators, um, our modeling collaborators, uh, including Elizabeth Brazil and Parker McCready, and our uh, collaborators looking at genetics. Uh, and, and in this case, Carolyn Teppel has been phenomenal in that. Uh, in that role. But as Emily pointed out, um, using a combination of modeling of the oceanography and modeling of the genetics, we've found that um, there is quite a bit of, um, although, although the populations on the coast and within the Salish Sea are distinct and different, there is a certain amount of uh, communication between those uh, populations. And so, whereas management needs to be distinct within the Salish Sea and on the coast, it is important that those things are done um, in cooperation or collaboration so that uh, um, decisions are made in concert. So, just kind of stepping through what we've already talked about to some extent uh, when considering these management goals, remembering that, of course, in the inland shorelines, these are relatively nascent uh, infestations, and the Strait of Juan de Fuca is sort of providing that semi-permeable barrier to larvae, so preventing a lot of input from the outer coast. But those coastal shorelines have uh, seen much larger infestations with the coast exposed to larvae from larger populations elsewhere. And what that means is that during the winter time, we have northern, uh, northward currents, uh, mostly from the, the Davidson Current. They're uh, moving uh, northward along the coast. Um, this is particularly the case during El Nino years, and they're bathing our area in larvae from Oregon and California. Uh, but in the, after the spring transition, those currents reverse direction largely, and then the coast is being bathed in larvae from uh, the outer coast of British Columbia. So the coast is getting it from both ends. But as I said, although um, although the um, although management likely should take place sort of independently within the Salish Sea and on the coast, we need different management plans. Those things do need to be coordinated because of the occasional weak connectivity, as we've seen both from the oceanographic modeling work and the genetics work done by Carolyn Temple. So the first management goal I just want to uh, tackle briefly is this idea of preventing additional invasion, because sometimes I think this one uh, seems a little bit surprising to most people. I mean, after all, green crab are here. Why do we need to prevent further invasions? We know that green crab have a complex life history. Of course, we see the adult green crab here. They have four zoeal stages plus a megalopal stage that's spread uh, planktonically. Uh, they have uh, spread on, on oceanographic currents. And so within our region, we're seeing spread naturally by way of larval dispersal. But additional invasions can take place either through ballast water or through the uh, movement of shellfish, seafood, or bait shipments. And I think it is very important to make sure that we prevent further invasions of uh, green crab. And um, it, the reason that we want to prevent further invasions is we want to prevent the um, addition of more genetic material to this population. And, and I know that sounds a little strange at first, but let me provide an example of why that's important. So what you're looking at here um, is, a, is a map of the, um, of, uh, the Northeast. Uh, this is um, uh, the area around Maine and the Canadian Maritimes. Before 1980, green crab populations had largely stalled out along the central Scotian self around Halifax. Uh, and essentially, the green crab populations there were not moving any farther northward. Then, relatively um, abruptly in the 1990s, uh, the area northward was uh, colonized and uh, northward expansion occurred all the way up here into Newfoundland. Subsequent genetic studies have shown that what we have here are actually two 
gen, uh, distinct genetic types. There's the more northern type, and then there's a more a southern type, and then there's actually a hybrid zone in the middle. And what's interesting about this is that uh, initially, over 200 years ago, the southern type uh, infested the U.S. East Coast, and um, that, because it was a more southern uh, type, um, it was limited in spreading too far north because of cold temperatures. A later invasion to that region from more northern European populations allowed green crab to spread much farther north. And in fact, the hybridization has provided that additional genetic material to um, allow green crab to spread more widely and to become more robust in the, the northeast. Fairly problematic. Um, as a, an additional um, issue to make matters a little bit worse, there seems to be some suggestion that this northern variety is actually even more aggressive than the southern form. It's hard to imagine anything coming from Canada that would be aggressive, but, um, but there you have it. Apparently these green crab uh, are, are a bit more aggressive. FYI, on the west coast, we only see evidence of the more southern variety. And we certainly do not want subsequent invasions to enhance the green crab populations here. I'd like to move on to some of the strategies that might help us to achieve some of these other goals. So not only preventing, uh, I've talked about preventing additional invasions, but I wanna talk about eradication or suppression um, as well. And um, in order to do that, oh, in order to do that, I, um, I'm gonna draw heavily on a diagram um, from a paper by uh, Stephanie Green and Ted Groschholz. They've done a nice job of illustrating um, in sort of a decision tree framework, some of the strategies that can be used to achieve management goals. Um, the most common goal, or I'm sorry, the most common strategy um, to achieve these goals is just eradication, to remove green crabs. It's a critical management strategy. It's shown here in yellow on the flow chart. And removal, of course, is a fairly simple strategy, uh, but in order for it to be effective, you need to consider the habitats in which you are removing crabs. You need to consider the crab behavior, susceptibility, which can be different based on season and reproductive stage. And also we need to be aware of non-target impacts. All right, so that's a fairly common one. Another key management strategy is to contain spread or to inhibit retention. Uh, this is commonly uh, seen as an important management strategy and it's indicated here in orange on the flow chart by Green and Groschholz. Now, containing spread or inhibiting retention or reducing retention can look like a lot of different things. Um, out in Willapa Bay, what that might look like is targeting control efforts in places that might see higher retention. What you're looking at here in this inset map is uh, some oceanographic modeling done by Neil Bannis, uh, in which he showed that areas of the southern portion of Willapa Bay actually uh, allow for higher degrees of retention. And so by focusing control efforts in the southern portion of Willapa Bay, we might be able to reduce retention of larvae in that uh, particular embayment. Another example might be to look at uh, more uh, human-made structures. In this case, the Lummi Sea Pond. We've heard from Bobby already about the situation in the Lummi Sea Pond. Uh, places like the Lummi Sea Pond, which are enclosed, uh, very shallow, uh, perhaps have warmer temperatures in the summertime and may have limited um, competitors and predators are more or less perfect nursery grounds for European green crab. And we see that actually fairly commonly. Um, so there's the Lemmy Sea Pond up there. Uh, two other examples of human-made structures which have acted as 
uh, nursery grounds for green crab, unfortunately, would include Redwood Shores Lagoon in Central California, that's in San Francisco Bay, and just north of San Francisco Bay, a place called Sea Drift Lagoon. Um, the actual Sea Drift Lagoon is, is that um, sort of oddly shaped longer lagoon adjacent to the much larger Bolinas Lagoon. Now, Redwood Shores Lagoon, for those of you who are familiar with green crab lore, you may know that Redwood Shores Lagoon is, is seen as sort of the ground zero for the West Coast invasion. Green crab were uh, transported to San Francisco Bay um, in the mid 80s. Uh, by the late 80s, green crab were found in higher numbers in Redwood Shores Lagoon and within a, a couple of years were, set, were found in the thousands. So this uh, shallow human-made lagoon served as a perfect incubator for the population. Sea Drift Lagoon is here on the right. Uh, as I said, it's another man-made pond adjacent to the much larger Bolinas Lagoon. And Sea Drift Lagoon has received significant media attention within the last year. In fact, about a year ago, uh, there were quite a few media reports about this area. In fact, this is just one of the headlines, lessons from a failed experiment when eradicated species bounce back with a vengeance. Um, you may have seen other articles describing this phenomenon as well. And so the, the work that was done in Sea Drift Lagoon is quite important, quite telling uh, in thinking about management. By about 2013, the population uh, within Sea Drift Lagoon decreased from a high of around 125,000 individuals to fewer than 10,000 individuals through a concerted effort of trapping down that population. But one year later in 2014, the population exploded to about 300,000 green crab within that lagoon. So that's about a 30 fold increase um, or uh, nearly triple the pre-eradication population size. This phenomenon is known as overcompensation or I think a more flashy way to describe it as the hydra effect. Um, this is not something that we expect to see in a lot of places, but it does happen in human-made lagoon structures because in these places, adult green crabs tend to be the dominant predator. Um, and by eliminating the adult green crabs, that actually improves survival for juveniles that, that actually leads to population rebound. As I said, um, we do not expect this overcompensation to occur in most natural areas within the Salish Sea or even on the outer coast. And that's because native predators are much more abundant and much more important. Um, but it is something that we need to be mindful of in a place like um, the Lummi Sea Pond. All right, the next management strategy that I want to talk about um, is suppression. When eradication or containment are not seen as appropriate or possible, suppression can be a useful management strategy. It's shown here in red, or I guess sort of a pinkish red uh, from the Green and Groschultz paper. An, an example of suppression is something that's done now in Maine. Uh, the Maine Clamors Association actually has a program called Five to Stay Alive in which they uh, support farmers and others in removing at least five green crab a day from their harvest beds. Another idea around this idea of suppression is what's called functional eradication. And this is an idea um, that it kind of centers around reducing green crab numbers to the point where they're no longer producing significant ecological impacts or economic harms. Um, and it's a, it's a relatively new consideration. Uh, Green and Groschultz have actually laid out a sort of a quantitative decision-making framework for this. Um, and, and it's something that I think can be explored in some areas, maybe not within the Sailor Sea, uh, and I'll get to why in, in just a moment, but perhaps out on the coast, this idea of functional eradication can be really important. As I said, and as uh, Emily pointed out previously, we actually already have numbers very, very low within the Sailor Sea, low to the point where we're not seeing 
that sort of ecological harm anyway. All right, last thing I'd like to do is move on to the tactics. And as I said, the tactics are the tools within our toolbox that, uh, that allow us to, uh, or that can be used as part of these strategies. Typically, when we think about tactics for invasive species, uh, we think about biological, chemical, or mechanical uh, tactics. And, and all of these have been explored for European green crab within their sort of worldwide range. I want to start with biological control or biocontrol. Uh, this is the idea that agents within the uh, sort of naturally occurring agents can be uh, either augmented or um, supplied to an area to tackle an invasive species. And, and this is very commonly um, something that we see with parasites. So parasites might be something that would be added to um, an invasive population to try and control that population. For green crab, most of the effort so far has focused on rhizocephalin barnacles, like what you're seeing here. So for those of you who are not familiar with rhizocephalin barnacles, if you've ever seen the movie Alien with Sigourney Weaver, that's essentially what rhizocephalin barnacles are. They're somewhat terrifying until you realize they, they only affect crabs. Um, they are a a castrating parasite, and because they castrate uh, adult males and females, they're seen as a way to disrupt reproduction. Now, whenever a biocontrol agent is introduced or is considered for introduction, oops, move on here, is ever considered for introduction, to control an invasive species, there's really important to consider non-target impacts. And this is done typically with laboratory trials. Uh, and uh, in the case of this particular rhizocephalin barnacle, that has been explored uh, for use here on the US West Coast. In fact, actually it was explored about 20 years ago now. Um, and um, it was deemed to be not appropriate, and I'll explain why. What you're looking at here is the results of laboratory trials in which this rhizocephalin barnacle was, uh, uh, where uh, green crab and native Dungeness crab were exposed to this rhizocephalin barnacle over a period of uh, days. And so what you're looking at is percent survivorship on the vertical axis and uh, days after settlement of the rhizocephalin barnacle called Sacculina on the horizontal axis. Um, and as you can see, the rhizocephalin barnacle does kill a, a lot of green crab. In fact, survival was uh, reduced by about 50%. Unfortunately, that same rhizocephalin barnacle killed all of the Dungeness crab. So the, the problem with this particular parasite is that because it's co-evolved with green crab, it is a very effective parasite of green crab, um, but uh, when new species are exposed to this parasite, it, um, it, uh, it just kills them outright. So as I said, this was deemed to be uh, a failure. Uh, and of course, we've never um, explored uh, using this parasite any further. Another type of biocontrol would be augmenting uh, native predators. And I think Bobby did talk about the idea of exploring, increasing um, the number of Chinook smolt within the Lummi Sea Pond, perhaps uh, cull larvae of green crab there. And that's something that could be explored as well. The next tactic that is frequently uh, explored for European green crab are, are chemical control agents. Uh, and in fact, the, the Australian government has probably explored this much more deeply than anyone else around the world. They've looked at over 40 different compounds uh, for their efficacy in killing European green crab, um, as well as many native species. Uh, there are limitations for using chemical compounds. Turns out that European green crab are fairly robust, especially when compared with a lot of native species. Uh, and they're usually typical, um, there's, there's usually a couple of different ways that these can be uh, delivered, uh, either through aerial spraying, like you're seeing here using a helicopter, or through poison baits. 
The real challenge, um, as I said, besides non-target impacts for native species is delivering an appropriate application concentration. Typically, uh, in order for uh, application concentrations to be effective, the, um, the, uh, the area needs to be dewatered. And so reducing the amount of water in areas so you can get appropriate concentrations of the pesticide or of the, the chemical agent are, are really critical. So that's an important consideration. The last tactic I'll talk about is mechanical removal. And the, the most common type of mechanical removal is, is trapping. Um, this is um, a tried and true method been around for a very, very long time. It's very simple technology, but it can be very effective. Uh, in part, uh, it uh, reduces non-target impacts. So those are minimized typically. Uh, the gear and resources are relatively inexpensive and the techniques require limited training. We have strong evidence that it works effectively within the Salish Sea. So um, just as a reminder from the graphic that Emily showed previously, those dark spots are places in which uh, early detection and rapid response were very, very useful for eliminating green crabs from those in those four locations. Um, there are ongoing efforts in the other places. And I just wanna highlight two of those uh, at Dungeness Spit, um, intensive trapping by uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service there, as well as their volunteers from 2017 through 2021, has greatly reduced the catch per unit effort of green crab at that location. So that's been uh, extremely successful in that location. And um, up at Drayton Harbor, uh, the Northwest Straits, as well as Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, starting in uh, 2019, going through 2021, that has also greatly reduced uh, catch rates there. So trapping has been, although it's, it is uh, a lot of work and, and it's been tremendous effort by these groups, uh, catch rates have dropped dramatically. It's been seen as a success there. Now, notably, we are benefiting from the oceanography uh, within the Strait of Juan de Fuca and, and hopefully will also benefit from uh, some little help from Mother Nature uh, if we can keep wintertime water temperatures down. So trapping is useful. Um, a couple of other things I, I wanna discuss just very, very briefly because we've already heard this discussed today and we hear this an awful lot is why not open up recreational or commercial harvest of green crab? Um, the idea of harvest incentives uh, to control invasive species has, ex has been explored pretty broadly. This has been a, a great review by Susan Pasco and, and Jason Goldberg. And I'll just kind of hit on a couple of points here. Um, it, you know, right now, California and Oregon allow recreational harvest. Um, there are some limitations to the value of recreational harvest or even commercial harvest. First of all, uh, green crab are not abundant in the places where most recreational or commercial harvesters would want to operate. Uh, they live in relatively isolated and in some cases relatively inhospitable environments. Um, the gear that's typically used for crabs on our coast, um, thinking about ring traps as well as box traps, um, are, are not really uh, set up for green crab. Green crab are smaller than the uh, crab species that we harvest uh, in our region. And frankly, the demand for green crab is low or, or extremely limited. These do not taste as good as our native uh, Dungeness and red rock crab. They do not get as large. And so having markets for green crab um, is, a, is a challenge. And that's something that in the Northeast um, states they're still struggling with now. Another, another, um, another tactic that has been explored are bounty programs. Um, and again, uh, Pasco and Goldberg talk about these as well. Um, the, the thing about uh, bounty programs is that uh, you need to consider animal behavior and population dynamics. You need to consider non-target impacts. And you also need to cons consider human behavior and economics. 
frequently when uh, bounty programs have been initiated for other invasive species, um, they're, they, they cost uh, money and resources to, to manage. Um, as the populations are reduced, there's less incentive to maintain the programs, and there are unintended consequences, in some cases fraud or in, intentional introductions to other regions. Uh, and there is also the issue of what to do with the bounty hunters once their bounties are gone. And this is uh, some examples from a newspaper in the New England region, uh, from a, from a uh, game, uh, a shellfish constable there that was working to support a bounty program, uh, indicating that these programs are difficult to manage. Um, and it's difficult for them to remain profitable for the bounty hunters. Um, and then there's actually the additional strange incentive, sort of counterintuitive incentive to give the bounty hunters large areas just to make it worth their while. So that's, that's sort of counterproductive to the actual bounty program in that situation. So in summary, I mean, I think that there is definitely uh, there's definitely, we've seen that there is um, uh, the continued effort to manage green crabs is warranted. It could get much worse. And so we need to work diligently. Uh, region appropriate management options really must be considered. That's sort of uh, distinct within the Salish Sea and out on the coast, but done in concert. There is strong evidence for continued trapping from both Drayton Harbor and Dungeness Spit. Washington can learn from the experiences elsewhere, especially on the US East Coast, down in Australia and other regions. And lastly, I just want to point out how important monitoring and research are. I know that, uh, that there is a lot of uh, interest in removing as many green crab as possible uh, and doing that as efficiently and as effectively as possible. But in order to do that, we really need to maintain monitoring and research both within the Salish Sea and out on the coast. Pretty much everything that uh, Emily shared with you earlier and that I shared with you just now uh, is um, in large part due to the monitoring um, that's been done by our, uh, by our partners uh, around the region uh, and by the volunteer monitors uh, within the CRAB team network, as well as our extensive network of collaborators, both within this region and uh, around the country, including uh, the US East Coast. I mentioned Carolyn Teppold's work as well, and I mentioned Elizabeth Brazil and Parker McCree's work at UW Oceanography. Um, maintaining uh, our monitoring and maintaining our research is, our efforts are really essential in order for us to understand the dynamics of these populations and to evaluate the efficacy of our approaches as we move forward with management. And with that, I will say thank you so much for your attention. And I believe that Emily and I could take some questions or perhaps we won't at this point. We are a little short on time before our scheduled break, but there's a couple questions that I do want to get to. Um, thanks so much for those presentations, Sean and Emily. And in particular, um, one of the questions was about sampling through environmental DNA. And I know this is something that the University of Washington has been doing some research on. And anything you're able to share in response to whether that's a tool in our toolkit at this time would be welcome. Emily, would you like to speak on that? Sure. Um, yeah, so uh, there has, we, we have a project um, on environmental DNA, um, and Sean's actually, you know, a PI on that project, and it's in collaboration with Ryan Kelly at UW, um, and the work has largely been done by a fantastic graduate student in the School of Marine Environmental Affairs, whose name is Abby Keller, and um, there's a paper recently out which represents Abby's work in taking a published environmental DNA assay um, created by folks who work in fisheries and oceans in, in Canada and um, working out the protocols here in our local waters as well as creating a model that helps us understand what um, 
what the findings of an environmental DNA assay and, and detection use look like in comparison to trapping methods. Uh, environmental DNA is, is not necessarily a brand new technology anymore, although typically when you apply it to a new system, there's, there's you know, kinks to be worked out and protocol, protocols to be developed. Um, but one of the biggest overarching efforts that impedes the use of environmental DNA as a detection and monitoring tool has to do with the uncertainty in how um, results from environmental DNA um, sort of assays uh, compare what they tell us about what we can see and touch and feel with our with our hands in terms of crabs and traps. Um, so there's a recent paper out uh, just last week um, that starts to explore that, and we're actually going to follow up on on the Crab Team website with a more detailed exploration of that. So I guess I'll leave that at that for the moment. Um, that the, the tool is in development, and there's some some promising new stuff on it. Thanks so much. And then one of the other questions before we just go to a break was there was there was uh, at least two questions about DNA evidence for the origin of Salish Sea green crab populations, both at Sook and then, if possible, at Lummy Bay. And I was just wondering if you could expand on what we know or what we don't know about where these crabs came from in the Salish Sea. Yeah, I can also provide a little bit on, on that. Um, so what, what we do know about all of the crabs that have been captured in the Salish Sea, the first thing I would say is that they all came from other West Coast populations. So we're not seeing any genetic evidence that would put the origin of Salish Sea crabs on the East Coast of the US um, or in you know, other parts of the invasive range like South America, Australia, South Africa, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that um, I, I mentioned that, there, that the population souk has a distinctive genetic signature. What that looks like is that um, that genetic signature is a subset of the genes that are present in the, the, the broader outer coast population. So if we look at green crabs from California to through BC, there's a lot of gene exchange that goes, um, goes along that, that indicates that these populations are well mixed. Um, and and that, what that means is that it's hard to tell if a crab came from Oregon versus BC when you look at its genetics. But we can tell if it came from Souk because of this, this genetic bottleneck, which is a, a total chance event, really. Um, in any case, within the Salish Sea, that means we can look at an individual crab and say, does this crab have a genetic signature like the crabs from Souk or like those from the outer coast? Did it come all the way through the Strait of Juan de Fuca or from that site just west of Victoria? And we have evidence that both processes are happening. Places like Dungeness Spit, we have found crabs that originated from the coast, but in the sort of Whatcom Skagit up to Boundary Bay areas, the crabs are showing signatures of both um, souk and the and the open coast as a genetic origin and you know the and also some interbreeding of those um, genetic lineages thank you so much um we're going to take a 10 minute break and then when we get back we'll have alan ploys giving a presentation on green crab emergency management and some of the plans for the coming year and then we'll have plenty more time for q a after um, my short discussion on green crab communication. So I know there was a number of more questions in the Q&A that I've saved, and then I'm sure there's more to come. Um, please save those for the end. And if you can just come back in 10 minutes, we'll continue the presentations at that time at 325. Thank you. Hey Chase, can you just check my screen, that I, my share screen to make sure it's working? I'm not seeing it yet. Please go for it. And then when you're done, Chelsea's got an interlude screen that she'll share. Is that showing now? All right. Thank you, Alan. Yep, we're seeing it. Okay. I'm not seeing your presentation, but it says you've started screen sharing. Oh. Um, so you may need to you're not, select. You didn't the see the presentation? No, I did not. You may just need to select the PowerPoint. Um, I've had trouble with that. There we go. Okay. Great. Looks perfect. All right. Thanks. See you in a bit. All right. Thanks, everyone. We'll get start. We'll resume at 325.
All right, everyone, thanks for sticking with us. We're pretty close to right on schedule. We're gonna have Alan with the discussion on green crab management and emergency measures. And then I'll have a quick discussion around communications and public outreach and education plans for the year ahead. And then we've got time at the end for additional questions and the panel discussion. I just wanna say thank you to everyone that's put questions in the Q&A so far, a lot of good engagement there and we appreciate that. So Alan, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Chase. We on our screen now? Looks great. All right. So uh, yeah, Alan employs Aquatic Invasive Species Unit Manager, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, thank you for attending today. First of all, as you've been seeing in the presentations, a lot of great information about uh, what's happening in, statewide uh, with a focus on the, the Salish Sea today. So based on all the information you're hearing uh, in coordination with our tribal co-managers, Washington Sea Grant, Shellfish Growers, and other partners, uh, we have found a significant increase in European green crab populations within the Lummi Nation Sea Pond and the outer coast areas, including Montcaw Bay, uh, Grace Harbor, Willapa Bay. And that new in information indicated an escalating danger of European green crab seriously threatening the environment, economy, and human well-being in the state of Washington. So that's, you know, 2021 is, is the year that all this is happening. So in that situation, we went to the governor's office through our RCW uh, to request that the governor it, um, uh, declare um, emergency measures, order emergency measures. And so on January 19th, uh, Governor Inslee issued uh, Proclamation 22-02, uh, and in there stated that the ongoing and expanding European green crab infestation poses an Im imminent danger to Washington State's marine environment, our marine-based economy, and the cultural well-being of both tribes and non-tribal residents, and that the costs of delay in, in uh, counteracting this infestation are unacceptably high. So in response in that proclamation, uh, Governor Inslee ordered the Department of Fish and Wildlife to begin implementation of emergency measures as necessary to affect the eradication of or to prevent the permanent establishment and expansion of the European green crab. So again, this is something that we would uh, you know, our, our goal would be eradication, but we also want to be uh, realistic about what our expectations are, what we can do, and uh, how closely we can uh, control these populations, and primarily how can we prevent uh, the threat of, of harming our economy and environment from this species. As we've shown, uh, one of our, the, the basic plan that we have at this point is the Salish Sea Transboundary Action Plan, which was signed in 2019 by the Department of Fish and Wildlife, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, Canada, Sea Grant, and Puget Sound Partnership. Um, as we noted in many of the slides, there are green crab up in the northern part of the Salish Sea, and our colleagues up there, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, are very concerned about it. They have been working uh, with us in collaboration. That's why this is a transboundary action plan, because if we don't work with them and they don't work with us, it doesn't, it doesn't help each other. And so um, they've actually implemented uh, work with Sea Grant to implement a similar type of crab team in the north. They're also working with First Nations in the Salish Sea and, and outer coast areas to uh, implement management actions. So it's, it is a broad, transboundary scale response, which is based a lot on collaborative management. That's a big theme today. Resource protection, prevention, early detection, local removal, control, uh, the transboundary cooperation, and research and adaptive management. I think all those pieces have been touched on today. Um, but that plan, again, was 2019, even though that wasn't that long ago. 
it was never designed to be a long-term plan. It was sort of, what are we gonna do in the next couple of years? And it was also not um, signed or really collaborated on initially by our tribal co-managers and other partners. So it's something that we need to rebuild upon. We think it is a good foundation, but that needs to be built upon as for the Salish Sea as well as the coast. Another slide that you've that you've seen again, just looking at the two basic management areas. You've heard reasons why there's different managements for the coast as well as for the Salish Sea, and uh, the hot spots that we've identified: Drayton Harbor, Lummi Bay, Macaw Bay, Grace Harbor, Willapa Bay within there, as well as the early detection network that Crab Team is is leading and our tribal co-managers and partners that are helping us around here. This is a, a, an amazing strategy, and I really want to emphasize, this is not anything that, you, that you, we have seen in any other state in, in the United States on the East Coast or even on the West Coast. You know, Alaska is putting together a, a big strategy up, up there to try to get ready for this, um, but nobody, no other state is really putting the effort that we are putting into trying to manage green crab. So this is a, a snapshot of um, all the captures in 2021. Some of the numbers may shift because, you know, as we are putting together these things, we're still uh, collating the data, trying to make sure quality control, looking for the gaps and such. But it's, it's the relative information that we've been hearing today about what's happening. So you have Drayton Harbor at the top, they had 146 uh, Cree crab captured in uh, this in 2021, and Lummi Sea Pond over 86,000 uh, green crab captured down in Macaw Bay, then you look Willapa Bay, Willapa Bay and Grace Harbor, even though those numbers may appear smaller, the trapping efforts were, were also lower. And um, the trapping efforts out in Willapa Bay and Grace Harbor we're also mostly still looking at the geographic scope of it, but in the later part of the season, there was some uh, concerted trapping, uh, so, you know, supported by Shoalwater Bay and, and others. And uh, so some of the CPUE capture per unit effort in those areas was very high. And so that's why we're ad identifying it. That's why the governor issued a statewide uh, emergency proclamation. You can also see comparisons of CPUE and those are you know, calculated for 100 traps. And again, that's uh, looking at uh, comparative, not a, as a specific identifier of exactly what's happening in each of those areas, but you're just seeing the relative comparison, you know, Drayton Harbor being fairly low compared to Sea Pond, you know, single digits versus hundreds. Uh, that's where you start going, oh, there, that's a lot of crap in those areas. We need, to, we need to deal with it. And then the map on the right, shows again that comparison CPUE by relative size of dot. And uh, so overall, over 100,000 green crab were removed from Washington waters in uh, 2021. So part of that uh, emergency measures and part of what we're trying to move forward with is a comprehensive funding package to enhance our uh, ability to deal with green crab. The legislature appropriated $2.3 million to Washington's develop, our department in uh, 2021. We're very appreciative of that. Unfortunately, we're finding that it's just not sufficient to be able to deal with the magnitude of the, in, the invasion and uh, significant increase that we're finding. So what are we asking for here? In the short term, what we want to do is, is hit the mud and hit the water as soon as we can, um, and the, we're, all, we're moving forward on some of the purchases right now, but within the legislative ask, we're looking for about two point, almost $2.5 million for the rest of this fiscal year. That would be uh, authorized spending from April 1st to the end of June, 2022. And then in fiscal year 23, looking a little bit over $6 million uh, for that, for the rest of the biennium. And so that's almost a almost eight point six million dollar ask. So what I want to do right now is just walk through each of these lines to give you an idea of what is that money going to buy, or what do we propose that money to buy here. So that first line, uh, DFW EGC statewide, 
That's the money that would come uh, directly to uh, the department, mostly uh, the aquatic invasive species unit, uh, working, you know, helping Chelsea and team uh, really ramp up quickly and you know, with our capacity for a comprehensive coordinated approach that in, to help engage our tribal co-managers, Sea Grant, local and state federal agencies, shellfish growers and other stakeholders for both short and long-term regional statewide actions. It's also, there's money in there to provide for a policy forum to uh, bring together these, uh, these entities, the jurisdictions and the stakeholders uh, to work together in developing the, both the long-term uh, planning as well as short-term prioritization. Where is the money gonna go? We can't put pots every place in where there's green crab. We have to prioritize. We have to figure out a strategy to be able to do this. Um, we're also looking at ramping up uh, the team here to be supportive. So looking at staff that would be uh, dedicated to the seed pond to support the Lummi Nation, looking at uh, enhancing uh, staff for the Salish Sea to support more prospect monitoring, as well as supporting our other partners in doing um, concentrated trapping in, in other areas. And we're especially looking to ramp up our efforts on the coast um, to increase, again, those support to the local management, as well as direct trapping of these hot spots to trap down the crab numbers as quickly as, 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 as much as possible. The next line here is a uh, DFW Coastal Green Crab Management Grant. So the concept here is that in 2022, there'd be about $100,000 available. And in 2023, there'd be $500,000 available. And this uh, grant is going to be uh, run through the department, but with a coordinated effort on the coast. We, we haven't uh, identified a, a entity yet that would be managing this grant, <coughs> excuse me. But the concept here is, you know, instead of trying to find light items, line items and identifying individuals on the coast that uh, we would put direct funding to, to create a pot of money that would be available to the coast uh, that would include uh, growers, it would include uh, the MRCs, it include local governments and managements, NGOs, uh, tribal co-managers, et cetera, that would be available. And that's that's one of the ways that we were wanted to get the money out to the local management. We're also looking at um, working with uh, within our department to enhance our uh, public affairs. Chase has been a, just doing an amazing job, uh, rapidly increasing our ability and our, and our exposure uh, on uh, green crab. We want to ramp that up significantly by actually hiring another person in our uh, public affairs because you know this communication and dissemination of information is critical to cooperative and collaborative management. So within this, we're also looking at a specific pass through to the Lummi Nation um, to uh, support their uh, work in the sea pond specifically. This is a high, high priority area with, uh, for us and for the, the Lummi Nation. And so we're looking at uh, being able to help support them, uh, putting in almost 1,500 traps that would be worked seven days a week uh, in, this, in this coming year. So at this point, as you saw, Bobby, uh, there's already been work in, in uh, bringing traps and uh, getting those traps ready. There's a lot of infrastructure. There's a lot of work that needs to be done to be able to hit um, those ponds and the, and the other waters um, with a lot of people and a lot of staff. It just, you know, we'd love to be out there right now, but really what's happening is we have to build that infrastructure and build the capacity, bring on new, new hires, which takes a lot of time, train those new hires, get them, them, them equipped, and then get them out there. So we're hoping to get everything moving in April, and that's a big lift, and that's where uh, a lot of our focus is happening right now. Again, looking at um, Macaw Tribe as another uh, hotspot area and supporting them with uh, approximately you know, hundred thousand dollars in in the rest of this fiscal year, and another five hundred in fiscal year twenty three, um, to uh, into, so they can do in, more intensive trapping in their coastal estuaries and their near shore waters. 
and they're also looking to implement trapping in the marine waters through use of a research vessel and contracts with their tribal fishers to conduct trapping in their usual custom areas. So what we're highlighting here is traditionally our trapping has been most mostly land-based. So we go drive to a location, we put a bunch of these traps on our backs, and then uh, I, should, I shouldn't say we, I should say staff do that. And uh, then they hike out onto the mud flats during the low tide, they set these traps, bait them, and then they walk, they come back out. And then the next day when the tide's back out, they go back out and uh, collect the, the, the crabs uh, and do the, re the work they do. So we're also uh, investing more into um, getting boat-based trapping. This is something that they do extensively up in Canada. And uh, we think it's a, a viable new, a better technique in many ways to try to get more traps um, and actually expand our trapping efforts into winter time as well. When you deal with uh, the winter in the, in the Pacific Northwest, the intertidal area becomes relatively inhospitable, um, both to the people trapping as well as the crabs tend to go into deeper waters. So we're looking at uh, using more boat-based traps. And that's where the shrimp pots actually are most useful because uh, I don't know if you saw it during the break, but um, Ron, one of our, our staff here, he had four of those shrimp pots on his back and that was all he could carry where you could basically put a dozen or more of the, the folded Pukui traps and uh, other traps um, and haul those around. So you can see the advantages or disadvantages between the different traps and how you go out. Washington Sea Grant, uh, Emily uh, was, was talking. And so we're looking at uh, helping them in the efforts that they're doing and the research they're doing. So um, another F, uh, piece that they do is coordination of local trapping efforts uh, in, the, in the coastal estuaries. And we're, we wanna support that more, support critical research to inform green crab management in Washington. So that's where we talked about the genetic work and we, you know, he's talking about uh, all the other pieces that the, in, in their um, presentations provide the scientific support for statewide and transboundary management planning. They're just, it, it's, it's a great partnership. We're so happy and, and lucky to have uh, Emily and Sean and Washington Sea Grant uh, on our team here. Uh, increased staff capacity and research funding to ensure continued monitoring at more than 50 sites. So currently their funding for the CRAB team ends at the in December of this year. So we want to make sure that they have the funding available to continue that trapping through the rest of the biennium. So RCO is Recreation Conservation Office. Um, they, uh, they would, we're looking at having them facilitate a multi-agency coordination group um, in collaboration with uh, our agency and the Invasive Species Council. The MAC group provides what is provide essential management mechanism for strategic coordination to ensure the incident resources are efficiently and appropriately managed in a cost effective manner. So one of the things that we've been wanting and needing for a long time is policy um, uh, support in this and uh, we need, but it needs funding to be able to make it happen. Here's another uh, pot of money that we are working to requesting. This again would be uh, managed through the Recreation and Conservation Office. It's a rapid response interagency inter agreement fund. The reason for this fund is that it could be disseminated, that money could be disseminated quickly to entities that need it in, in a very short term. Where the coastal grant would be more of a competitive grant. Uh, and it might it would take a little bit longer for that grant system you know process, but it would it wouldn't take you know it, it'd still be fairly quick, but it does uh, the interagency rapid response would be very quick, and we could uh, disseminate that money out very quickly um, as as the as as we need. And then finally, a, another pot of money is the local uh, AIS local management grant. Um, that is uh, currently under statute. It's a broad aquatic invasive species grant. It's the intent is to try to encourage and support local management. It would be a competitive grant. 
uh, probably um, once a year, the grant process would open up and it would be about $500,000 a year. So would the interagency uh, agreement fund be about $500,000 a year. So we're looking at about $1.5 million total in grant funding as part of this proposal that could be available to multiple groups uh, in to support both uh, specifically green crab for the coastal management grant, but uh, broader aquatic invasive species um, for the rapid response and the local management grants. So in the meantime, um, the department has authorized $600,000 in spending uh, for this uh, three month period that we're right in right now, January to March, uh, with emphasis on supporting the Lummi Nation sea pond. And uh, $300,000 is for uh, within uh, my unit to uh, purchase traps and boats and other equipment and supplies, getting ready for um, the, the staffing to, to, to be able to hit the, the waters and the grant and the mud as quickly as possible in April. Another $300,000 is passed through to the Lummi Nation. Same thing to help them uh, purchase traps, boats, and um, infrastructure work. So these are, these are the critical pieces that if we didn't get it going now, we would continue to be delayed and uh, have a late start again in, in, um, in January, not January, July or so. And that's just way behind the curve if we're talking about emergency management. We're also, um, we'll be using our existing funds and, re and to reprioritize our seasonal um, workforce. The $2.3 million that we got in 2021 uh, basically provided uh, support for uh, Chelsea, uh, a, a permanent biologist who's Ron, and then six seasonal technicians. And um, those seasonal technicians, of course, uh, typically work from April to uh, October. And so what we're doing right now is we're going to reprioritize those six to support the Lummi Sea Pond. Um, and then when, and I'm going to say when, we get the legislative funding, then we can uh, backfill the, the rest of the, the staffing that we need for the statewide response. Um, we're also wanting to set up a policy technical communications and coordination with tribal co-managers, state and federal agencies, and other stakeholders. So this is one of those uh, the uh, pathways that we're doing that to inform uh, you uh, how you know what's going on and um, and what we you know how our, what the planning is. So with that, um, I'm going to open it up to questions. Thanks, Alan. I had, uh, there's one question that Marilyn had asked a little while back that I think you would be well suited to address. And it's about the feasibility of eradication and whether eradicating green crabs is feasible. And then, you know, as you think, look at this in the long term, um, how we set our goals around population management versus eradication in specific sites. What are your thoughts on that? Well, the way we've been uh, working this is, I think it's along the line. I think if you remember what Sean was saying about that paper by uh, Green and Groschholz, they talked about functional eradication. Functional eradication was basically reducing the population down to a level where a they either don't, they can't, they can't reproduce or create, you know, be self-sustaining, or b that you bring them down below a level that no longer is causing harm to the environment or the economy, you know, those resources. So those are those are. It's not that you got rid of every single one of them. So it's it's uh, we've tried and we've done a lot of trapping, but when you have a few crab that are sparsely located around, you could trap and trap and you could spend hundreds of thousands of dollars trapping a handful of crab where when they're so diverse and they're so spread out, basically they're, they're, at, a, they're at a level where we just, we think they, even if they, uh, two of them got together and reproduced, the chances of their, you know, uh, successfully spawning and creating a, a you know a new population are very low, so we have to look at and, and choose which areas we want to prioritize and how 
how far we can go to reduce that population down to where they become um, not a problem. And you know, as as Emily and Sean also pointed out, we have larvae. It's you know, if if um, if you think about um, sort of a sort of an analogy of a bathtub, we can't turn the faucet off. The larvae are going to keep coming in. So even if you you eradicated or took out every single green crab out of uh, an area uh, one year, new larvae are going to come in and and land in those areas. So again, there's a cost benefit of how far do we go and and what how many crab do we trap down to until we can say you know we've done a good job. And the point is is these crabs are going to be coming in for a long time. And what we hope to do in the long term is start working with our colleagues down in uh, California and Oregon and convince them that management is the right thing and to move forward on uh, more of a coastwide management so that we don't have these huge influxes of larvae coming in from these other populated areas once we, we, we're trapping ours down far enough. Thank you. Um, I have a slide about this in the next presentation, and I know this was a question that's come up several times already. It'll probably come up more. But early on, Ian had asked about, given that this is an emergency issue as declared by the governor, is there any workaround for the current prohibition on retaining European green crabs? As of right now, as, as you know, the revised code of Washington says that it is illegal to possess live European green crabs as they are a prohibited level one species. And I think the question here is just under the emergency order, are there any shortcuts to changing that? Or is this still something that we're looking at in the long term? It's always a long term. You know, one of our, our underlying premises is adaptive management. If we find that these are, that is a viable way to help uh, in our efforts to reduce the populations down to those levels which where they're not producing harm, then we will uh, follow through with that. In the short term, right now, it is not a viable option for us. Um, the amount of education that we need to do with the public to identify what a green crab looks like is getting a lot better, but we're still, the vast majority of, of reports that we receive where people think that they found a green crab it's not a green crab, it's a native mm -hmm. uh, species. And so we wanna prevent unintended uh, consequences to our native species by well-meaning people going out and trapping. The other part is that, you know, the traps that we use are not the usual traps that you would find in the Puget Sound. So you're gonna have, have a lot of bycatch. And then, you know, there's always the, the people is like, oh, I'm out here, I'm out here trapping green crab. Well, are they actually, you know, what are they doing with the other species that they're capturing there? So the enforcement of this is also tr uh, difficult. And we also want to protect those species that do get into the traps. We, we do see a lot of bycatch in these traps and they're native species. So how do you handle that? How do you trap? There's a lot of complication to that. And those are things that we'd have to consider before we'd open it up to recreational or commercial harvest. Thank you. Um, so it'd be good now to clarify a little bit about WDFW's plans and actions for the coast. I see that Bill had asked, you know, we know that there's funding that's been requested to support additional work on the Washington coast, but whether there's any actions in the short term um, is something that you and I have talked about. And I know that there's a lot of discussions happening right now about WDFW's responses out in the coast and how we can ramp up local coordination. But I just wanted to give you an opportunity to expand on that a little bit. Um, because as Bill had asked about work that DFW is going to be conducting outside Lummi Sea Pond. Well, outside Lummi Sea Pond, so is it specific to the coast or is it just outside Lummi Sea Pond? Um, outside Lummi Sea Pond. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I think, um, again, what we, we're trying to do is figure out what, what's the hot spots, what do we need to do with the amount of resources we have right now, what is the, big, the biggest benefit for the effort. And um, as we've seen within the Salish Sea, 
we have a very unique situation with the uh, Strait of Juan de Fuca bottleneck. Um, we have, it's very sparse in other areas and uh, you know, in these other areas, and the Lummi Sea Pond is a very unique situation. If it became, if it becomes a seed source, a larval source for the rest of the Salish Sea, that is just becomes, um, it, it could become untenable for uh, continuing the management that we can within the Salish Sea. It's a very tough call. Um, we have to make those calls and uh, but our intent is to make this a statewide issue and that's where the critical piece comes in uh, through the legislature. I would encourage you to uh, I would encourage our, our stakeholders, partners and everybody to let their legislators know that this is important to you. Right now is a very important time for you to contact them and let them know that this is important. This funding is important. Uh, it's critical to um, effective management. Thank you, Alan. Um, and Bill, if you have additional questions on that, feel free to follow up with us. I think um, just one follow up regarding commercial harvest. Ian notes he was thinking about allowing commercial harvest with selective gear in heavily impacted areas. And he, he suggests that the fishermen could figure it out. And so I know we can, we'll probably discuss that a little bit more during the panel. Um, I'm not seeing additional questions specific for you, Alan, but I know we'll lean on your expertise during the panel discussion at the end today. Anything else you want to add before we jump? Well, again, I think, you know, when we talk about recreational commercial harvest, those are things that we can look at as, as far as adaptive management in the longer term. And I think, um, you know, on the coast that, you know, there could be different options on the coast than you would see in the Salish Sea. Um, that's why we need these policy forums to come forward and to be able to have these discussions. Where, where do they want to go? How do they want to move this forward? And because uh, it, it all takes resources. Somebody's got to put things together. Somebody's got to watch what's going on. Somebody's got to figure out where's the data coming and how it's effective or not effective. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank I'm going to switch over to a quick presentation and discussion guide around Green Crab Communications, Outreach, and Public Reporting. But given we've been in a little over two hours of PowerPoint at this point, I'm hoping to keep it fairly short so we save time for the panel discussion with the experts at the end. All right, I stole this photo from Chelsea, but I think it really helps to um, visualize the threat here. First off, just a little bit about me. I'm one of the newest members for WDFW. I started late last year. Um, I'm based in the public affairs unit in the department's director's office, but assigned to support both the North Puget Sound region as the Puget Sound region communications manager and the aquatic invasive species team. So dove right into this green crab issue. And while I'm new to the department, I've worked for a little over a decade in natural resources, communications, policy, and conservation. And in, just until recently, my family ran a small shellfish operation down on Hood Canal. So I'm little bit familiar with the shellfish industry and very familiar with getting stuck in the mud out in our estuaries. And my contact information is here on the slide. If you have any suggestions or questions around green crab or other aquatic invasive species outreach or communications, please don't hesitate to follow up with me. So as many of you know, we've had a real uptick in attention on this issue going back to late 2021. I did a count this morning and well over a dozen independent media articles, many more than that. If you count reprints published across various publications, um, it's clear that the public and the media is picking up on this emergency. And that's a good thing. We want to, we need that attention to help drive the response that really matches the scale of the problem. 
This is just a couple of the clips that were published over the last few months about the green crab emergency from our own internal channels. And I know that Washington Sea Grant, Northwest Straits Commission, Northwest Treaty Tribes, and a number of other entities published updates and blogs as well, but then all the way up to national media outlets like CNN and USA Today that were covering this issue. And I think we have a few local reporters on the briefing today, so thank you very much for tuning in. One of the things that we hope to see is similar coverage as we start to roll out deployment of coordinated management strategies and trapping at a really increased scale. And so I will be working with media contacts and other communications professionals to try to get the word out, not just about the emergency, but about the coordinated response that WDFW and all the partners are doing to respond to that emergency. And as part of that, as Alan mentioned, one of our goals is to improve community outreach, education, and public reporting around European green crabs this year. We've had someone from the Public Affairs Unit, most recently me, assigned to support the AIS team, but we know that this issue in particular really demands a higher level of community outreach. People want to know about these invasive crabs, they want to know how to identify them, they want to know what to do if they find one, and as we've seen today, they want to know how they can help. So that is one of the things that's specifically identified in our emergency measures funding request to the state legislature during this supplemental session. It's a position that we hope to be able to begin hiring for this spring that will work closely with me, focused around community outreach and environmental education dedicated specifically to European green crabs. And as you can see in this timeline, uh, that is contingent on legislative funding, but we've already started preparing what that position might look like, as well as what a outreach plan for European green crabs throughout the course of the year would include. And we hope to begin moving forward with that by late March, early April, depending on the conclusion of the legislative session. And, and as you see here, the legislature is scheduled to conclude in mid-March. It wouldn't be the first time that a supplemental session has gone long, however. One of the things that that position will be doing is provide a much higher level of capacity to attend community events, fairs and festivals, assuming they start up again this summer after the past two years, stakeholder briefings, meetings, farmers markets, anywhere we can to continue getting the word out about what your European green crabs are, how to identify them, what to do. We know that these are topics that people are interested in. I've seen the comments on our social media about people looking for more information. I've seen them in our emails. I've seen them from stakeholders such as yourselves. We wanna really rise to that need and get this information out there. We're also going to be developing improved online and print materials supporting green crab outreach, and then particularly helping to consolidate public reporting. Right now, there, there's so many good partners involved in this work, and many of those partners have excellent resources to report green crab sightings. We're looking to be working with Washington Invasive Species Council and Washington Sea Grant in hopes of consolidating those reporting channels a bit um, in the interest of a more central database and a, and a more central location where Washingtonians can go and report their sightings and provide photos or other evidence to back that up. Because as Alan had mentioned, we, we do have many cases, unfortunately, where native shore crabs, kelp crabs, and other species are reported as European green crabs. The goal here is that by summer, we will have a dedicated staffer to support green crab outreach, community engagement with a whole set of updated tools to help get the word out about this invasive species. Now, one of the things that we've touched on a couple of times today is the regulatory environment around EGC. And I've got down here at the bottom, um, just a screen grab of the revised code of Washington that relates to prohibited species. And at present, European green crabs are a prohibited level one species. And this is the advice that we have on our website as far as regulations for the public to follow when encountering green crabs. We know that there's a lot of feedback on this topic. It's as several presenters and most recently Alan mentioned, it's something that we are considering in the long term. But for now, this is the regulatory environment that we're working under. And again, if we've done 
some updates to our communications materials and green crab outreach documents and web pages already this year in light of all the developments over the past few months. And if you ever have feedback or additional news to share, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Now, I just want to open it up. I want to, again, I want to save time for the expert Q&A, but if you do have ideas for green crab outreach, communications, events or conferences that we can table at or present at, or other input about how we can engage the public and stakeholders in this issue under existing regulations, please, please feel free to drop them in the chat or to send me an email. Um, we, again, are really trying to ramp up not only green crab emergency management, response, trapping, and science, but also outreach to the public about this important issue. And as stakeholder leaders, your input is very much welcome. And there, there's that infamous photo of Ron trekking four shrimp traps out into the marsh at Willapa Bay. Um, as heroic as that is, I think a boat might work a little bit easier on his knees next time. All right, well, I'm, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. Do want to thank Josh Temple for his comments along the way. Josh, really appreciate your support. And all of the other questions, I think we can respond to with the panel of excerpts. So I'm gonna stop screen sharing. Again, if you have any feedback or comments around public outreach, communications, media requests, please feel free to follow up with me. And my colleague Mark has put the, we, we have an identification guide that helps show green crabs in comparison to several native shore crab species. That's in the chat. And I know that Washington Sea Grant has some great materials on their website as well around green crab identification. All right, well, if you are a member of our expert panel, I'm gonna ask you to go ahead and please turn your camera on. And again, if you have a question that you've been saving up, please feel free to drop it in the Q&A. Thank you to everyone that's stuck with us this afternoon. One of the things that I've been thinking about that I wanna get just to kick it off here, and it looks like we've got seven other questions in the chat right now, but to get us started, I would ask all of you just to go around and say, what, what is the thing that concerns you the most about the impact of green crab in Washington? And then what is the thing that gives you the most optimism in terms of our response and our ability to manage this infestation? Alan, you're in my upper left. Is it okay if we start with you? Well, I'll, I'll start with um, more of the positive side. We're, we're on the leading edge of this invasion. We have an opportunity here. And I'm very heartened by the, the number of people that are taking up this challenge and saying we need to do something about it. That's huge. And that is that is not usually heard in, in our invasive species world until because usually what happens is you have the massive invasion and they're everywhere and it's already too late. And then people are saying, well, why didn't you do something about it? Um, or they basically say, as soon as they find it, they give up. But we're not giving up here. We're moving forward. And um, I just, I'm really uh, pleased with the, the group of people that we've been working with, uh, with Washington Sea Grant, our tribal co-managers, um, our shellfish grower partners, uh, state agencies, federal agencies, uh, NGOs, there's a huge amount of people that are working towards this problem. I, I just, I think it's, it's amazing uh, and I'm honored to be part of, of this process. And I don't think I wanna add any negative highlight to that. So I'm just gonna stop it at that point. So thanks everybody. Thank you, Alan. And then Ali, I just wanna say that we're working on getting you um, promoted to the panel. Oh, looks like you're there now. Um, Emily, you're next on my screen. Do you wanna respond to that question about concerns and also reasons for optimism? Yeah, I think um, Alan kicked us off nicely in, in starting in the um, 
in the positive vein. And I think that there, there's, you know, a lot of those things are things that I find myself sharing time and time again, that it does just astound me from day one of, of crab team when we were out recruiting and training back in 2015, just how, how easy it is for people to connect with this issue in a way that um, moves them to action. I think it's, uh, that's, that is 100% like critical to any, any successful effort. Um, and that, uh, and, and we have it in, in spades here in Washington, um, which is, which is only going to benefit us. I think I might reframe the concern as a curiosity. Um, <laughs> and, and, uh, and offer that, you know, I think um, one of the things that, that, that we see is that every invasion that happens is different as it happens. And as I mentioned, the, the best that we can do as, as biologists is to learn and, and try to use what we've seen elsewhere, but it's never a perfect prediction. So my curiosity has to do with, um, are, are we headed, <laughs> you know, like we think we're headed in the right direction in terms of um, estimating impacts or gauging what they're likely to be and population trajectories. Um, but there's always room for surprises. In, in some ways, we've been surprised already in, in terms of, you know, we found crabs at Dungeness Spit um, in 2017 and assumed they were coming from Souk because Souk is the closest place. And yet already we've been, um, we've learned that, that it's much more complicated than we, than we thought it was. Um, so my curiosity is where does that, that go next? Thank you, Emily. And I want to jump over to Chelsea again quickly and Chelsea makes a good point that we should introduce some of the folks on the expert panel here that didn't previously provide a presentation. So Chelsea, I'm going to turn it over to you to do a round of introductions. And then I'd also love to hear from you about reasons you see for optimism. <laughs> okay, yeah. So um, everyone's getting added right now. Sorry about that delay. We have to find your name and add you in. So I'm just going to go down the list that's from the agenda to introduce everybody. Um, we had the presenters, so uh, myself, Alan, Emily, uh, Bobby, <laughs> sorry, I'm looking for everyone's faces. I'm not sure if Sean is still on the call, but he could, okay, he's not here, so. Um, we have Allie Simpson, who's here from the Northwest Straits Commission, Lawrence Solman, who's the um, Fish and Wildlife Service at the Washington Maritime National Wildlife Refuge Complex, the Dungeness Spit area. We have Carl Mueller, who's at Lummi Nation. Um, Neil Harrington, I think that we're trying to find you. Um, Neil Harrington will be on, and he's from Jamestown Squalum Tribe. Bill Dewey with Taylor Shellfish, and Roger Fuller with the Padilla Bay National Ashburn Research Reserve. So that's our panelists there. All right. And what was my question? <laughs> Well, our icebreaker questions were just around reasons that you see for concern, which I think we've covered a lot of those today, and then also reasons you see for optimism in terms of our ability to manage green crab infestations, both locally and around the region. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the concern is staying ahead of the curve, right? And there's a lot of partners involved, and I, um, I think that my right side of it is that we are a uh, very enthusiastic state and our partners are very enthusiastic to get in to do these things. So I'm hopeful in that aspect. And um, we, you know, we're building a lot of relationships and I think we're moving in the right direction with that. Thank you. Does anyone, we've got so many panelists now and I've got to put a list of questions that's growing. Um, does anyone else want to jump in on that topic? reasons for concern to you or your your area of expertise or area of interest and then also reasons for optimism i'll just jump in uh chase and share my optimism with the uh information presented today and that i've been aware of previously there in dungeness and drayton you know in the in the sailor sea here if we jump on some of these smaller populations quickly that there's actually a chance of, of getting a handle on control there. So just uh, makes it worthwhile to put the effort in here. Thank you. Anyone else want to share before I go along to the question? Oh, Carl, I see you've got your hands up. Please go for it. 
Yeah, I just uh, I I want to echo everyone's sentiments about about optimism. Um, it's a uh, it is no small feat that as many people who are represented um, here today, uh, not only uh, you know our, our our constituents, but the 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 folks participating in the 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 meeting across the board. Um, it is very remarkable that all of these people with all of these different background are coming together in a unified front to address the issue. And, um, and I will say on a, a personal note, it is the, it, it is really the only issue that would uh, bring me back to the fight uh, with a scheduled retirement of March 4th, uh, which is no longer happening because I have assumed the uh, aquatic invasive species coordinator position for the Lummi Nation and will be around for a couple more years um, because it's it's the right fight and um, I know we all can make a difference and there's been some great suggestions really great updates and I look forward to getting back into the fold here uh, certainly participated uh, very heavily for uh, a good solid year and a half from 2019 to uh, uh, July of 2021, uh, taking the lead for Lummi uh, with my collaborator, Nick Jefferson, who uh, is also here today. Um, and we kind of just stepped back when Bobby came on board. So uh, no shortage of work and many hands make light work. Looking forward to getting back into it. Thank you, Carl. Anyone else want to share before we jump into the questions? Sure, I'll, I'll uh, share just a little bit. This uh, Roger Fuller at Padilla Bay, and I, I would just echo a lot of what other people have said. That, that my optimism is that uh, it it appears that if we are um, very aggressive with our trapping, that it actually does pay off, and and um, where we. I like to see that in a number of different places. I'm, I'm things I'm a little bit concerned about is I, I think our state, as as others have said, is is very active on this front. I would love to see our neighbors to the north and south be more active the, in ways that could support um, what happens in this state uh, in terms of larvae sources. So that would be great. And we've been able to do a lot of trapping in Padilla Bay in the past couple of years, largely as a result of some um, great free labor from college interns uh, being funded through sources, um, other sources. Some of those sources have disappeared. So our ability to trap intensively is, is uh, a little more challenging now. So I, I really appreciate the emergency proclamation that's been made and the, uh, hopefully the additional funding that will be put towards this because it's, um, it's something we really need to be ramping up on. And uh, it, for us here locally, just at Padilla Bay, um, things are a little tighter than they have been the past two years. So I'm really glad that we can start working more with the Northwest Straits and others to tackle that and keep that going at a, at a even higher level than, than has been able to happen in the past. So that's another reason I'm really optimistic is those increased funding to some really key partners. Thank you, Roger. And I'm just, I'm gonna put a couple of resources in the chat too. There's been, um, a news release that UW just put out this afternoon from some of the work that Sean and his team and Emily and the whole uh, outfit over at University of Washington on the use of eDNA. And then one of our attendees also flagged that coming up is National Invasive Species Awareness Week. And I know that the Washington Invasive Species Council is coordinating a couple different events related to, or, or webinars related to green crabs and invasive species management that week. I'll drop those in the chat. While I'm doing that, there's been a couple questions that I think um, all the expertise on this panel would be helpful with. One that's been on the Q&A sheet for a while has, um, Lynn had asked about advice for future beach restoration designs that could best discourage green crab habitation and whether that's something that we can avoid through or at least attempt to prevent through active restoration work of which we all know there's a lot of it going on in Puget Sound and more needed. Is there any thoughts on that about how we can attempt to discourage green crabs through restoration work 
or are they just too adaptable? Carl, you've got your hand up. If you want to go ahead, I yeah, it's a I, tough question. I, I think that it's, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that we've seen um, is, you know, I, I kind of going back to that optimism, I mean, I'm encouraged that, you know, green crab have, uh, in terms of their colonization and, and these founding individuals here and there, you know, I think the, you know, the, the, the biotic resistance that we have here uh, in our kind of our natural shorelines um, is going to be one of those things that uh, really comes into play in terms of, uh, you know, the numbers staying down. So, um, you know, where there are those restoration efforts, I would encourage them to, um, uh, you know, try to function as naturally as possible um, to um, give that biotic resistance the best leg up. Thank you. And if anyone else has anything to add, feel free to jump in now or raise your hand. Otherwise, I'll move on to another question. One of the, one of the questions, um, Tammy Davis from Alaska Department of Fish and Game had asked something that I, that I think is, um, is worth digging into a little bit further, given the information that we have about different green crab subspecies or ecotypes, whatever, whatever they would be present on the East Coast. Her question is around, are there thoughts about hybrid European green crab, crab from inland populations and greater thermal tolerance, behavior, et cetera? And I, I thought she was referring to some of Sean's presentation about the types of green crab present on the East Coast. But if you, as the experts, think it's better to dig into distinctions between green crab as individuals in the Salish Sea versus the coast, I defer to you. Sure, I can provide just a little more detail. So you're, you're, you're right, Chase, that um, Sean's presentation covered two different ways in which gener genetic variability has been seen to play out across landscapes in different, in different invasive ranges. Um, the story from the East Coast was largely one of two different um, genetic lineages that that came from the native range directly from the native range to the east coast a more cold tolerant um, lineage and a, a more warm tolerant lineage and the addition of new genetic resources to to a population that had been on the east coast for 200 years is um, was really responsible for accelerating the speed of the invasion and the severity as well as expanding the possible range for green crab on that coast um, and that, that uh, the second introduction happened sometime in the 1980s and these changes are still playing out um, on the East Coast. Now on, on our coast, you know, I, I talked about, we have, um, we have, and Sean also mentioned this, that all of the crabs that we've ever found and looked at the genetics of on the West Coast, all came originally from the East Coast by, uh, by way of the East Coast, originally from the Southern portion of the native range. So we have one of those two um, genetic lineages on the West Coast, and that's all of the crabs that we've ever found so far on the West Coast and, and looked at their genetics. Now, we do see within that group that we see a little bit of differentiation in crabs specifically that come from Souk Basin. And therefore, we've been able to track individual crab movements or trace them back in terms of uh, where their genetic resources are linked to in, in the population level. Um, we, while we currently see what's called admixture in the, in, you know, the, the, the genetics folks talk when, when these two lineages come together and make an offspring, that's called admixture. And uh, when we see that happening, right now, all we can say is that that is happening. We found evidence of it. In terms of what it might mean for um, cold tolerance, warm tolerance, anything like that, that's something that, that we don't know yet. It's actually uh, Carolyn Tiefold, who's the, the PI on that study, is interested in looking at um, thermal tolerance at the at the leading edge of the invasion. So how does different how do different um, genetic resources related to temperature tolerance 
um, play a role in the unfolding invasion, but um, that research is ongoing. Hopefully that answers that. Thank you so much. Anyone else have anything else to add on green crab genetics or the differences in populations between the coast and the Salish Sea? All right, well, one of the other questions, um, where was it? There was a couple questions about additional tactics for attracting and trapping green crab. One about using pheromones to attract crabs and use them as a tactic. Is this something that anyone on this call is familiar with? If not, that's all right. I can provide a little background okay. on that. Um, so there have been a couple of researchers on the West Coast who have tried to work with pheromones to use as opposed to we use fish as bait right now, right? So the idea would be, can we use pheromones to attract crabs to traps? And there's a couple of different strategies that you could imagine could be useful. A, if crabs for whatever reason aren't hungry, maybe you can use the pheromones that males use to find females when they are females are ready to mate and get crabs to come to traps at that time. Um, as far as I know, that part hasn't necessarily been successful. It's really hard to work with pheromones because they're really unstable and sensitive. You know, you dump a bunch of this stuff in the water and it's immediately unstable due to pH and temperature changes and things like that. Um, the, the holy grail though, <laughs> that I know that there are some people that are still interested in working on is, could we figure out a way to attract females to traps? Um, I, I think this is, you know, through the, the, the idea, you know, females increase the reproductive potential of the population a lot. You saw those photos that Chelsea shared of green crabs with huge egg masses, it's a lot of eggs. Um, and so the question is, can we disproportionately target females to remove them from the population? Um, females are notoriously difficult to get them to come into traps because the males are usually larger and, and more aggressive and more willing to take the risk. So our trap catches are just by virtue of behave, crab behavior bias towards males. Um, but we'd like to remove more females. Thank you. And then Emily, we did have a follow-up question from Tammy about whether BC has done anything in terms of genetic testing for their population. Do you know anything about that that we can touch on quickly? And if, if it would take more, we can always follow up. I, I can just say that yes, BC um, is absolutely participating in sending crabs, and there's a lot of uh, information that's being learned on that side as as well. So, thank you. Um, Josh had asked about whether we had identified a catch per unit effort threshold that would indicate successful mitigation of a site infestation. Uh, and he says, considering general methodology of utilizing shrimp slash prawn traps on a 24 hour soak. And it sounds like this is to inform some trapping going on up in BC. And I think I just open it up for um, any information you're able to share about how we determine catch per unit effort thresholds and what that looks like in terms of indicating successful mitigation at a local infestation site. Um. I'll, I'll jump in a little bit here. Um, so it's it's a it's a moving target, and uh, there's a lot of pieces that come into play. It's it's a target that we we continually discuss. Um, you know, Dungeness Spit is one area that you could say, well, uh, and and uh, um, we could talk down, you know, about that. Um, but the, the, the one aspect is, to me, it's uh, when we have a detection in a new place. So for example, when there was a detection in the San Juans back in, you know, the first detection there and the detection down at Padilla Bay, um, the initial thing was a rapid response. So the first, the, the initial effort was in Padilla Bay was, you know, uh, early detection monitoring site, six, six traps, 
you know, that were, were looked at in, in one month. And so there was a crab talk. So we, we went in there and we put out hundreds of traps for, uh, you know, a week and we didn't find any more. So at that point we said, there, there are just not a lot of crab out here. And if we kept putting out hundreds of traps, we might eventually catch another one, but we felt like the population was just so small and so scattered that it wasn't worth that effort. I think that's the same thing that happened down in Padilla Bay. It had a, a actually was a hand caught a crab that initiated a, a very large rapid response effort. Multiple agencies went out there for a week, put out a whole lot of, of pods, caught four more green crab, quite you know spatially distributed throughout Padilla Bay, and we decided you know they're just very sparse and more traps isn't gonna help us really do much here. There, it's, it's, it's within a, a reasonable, it's, it's a subjective call, but it's, uh, it's important. But both, um, you know, in these, both of these areas, we're go, they're going back and continuing trapping and it's still looking at early detection monitoring, but maybe at a little bit higher level. So that doesn't necessarily mean there isn't gonna be continued trapping in those areas, but you're going to modify the trapping to what you think, uh, you know, based on the, the effort, based on the, the research and, and based on your, your resources at that point. Because as, as we've been telling, those larvae keep coming in and depositing in these areas. So we want to make sure that we're, we're tracking it over time. So, um, you know, Roger or... Um, um, Sorry, Solomon, and you guys want to talk a little bit about your 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 efforts down there? Yeah, I, I think that you know the way you've characterized it is 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 great. So it's it's uh, um, we have not to date found a lot of green crabs in Padilla Bay. We had I think a total of eleven detections this past um, summer with uh, our trapping as well as some from the Sea Grant sites. Um, and so it's not a lot, but we've put out this past year, I think we put out 1200 traps or something altogether in our bay. So we're still at a low detection level relative to the amount of traps that, that are out there. We, as I mentioned earlier, we we've, were blessed last year with being able to use some uh, essentially free labor from some college interns that, that um, were funded by different uh, other people. <laughs> so that we were able to put them to work and really increase our trapping to a level that we would not have been able to do otherwise. And so I think that that those kinds of resources um, are really important and, and valuable, whether it's, uh, you know, the Sea Grant volunteer approach or using interns and other sources of people who are really interested in helping out in some way. Um, those kinds of, of low cost efforts, I, I think, are, are really valuable to help with especially with that kind of detection trapping where the numbers are really low and so you're not you're not catching a lot um, that's been really beneficial to us and, and we've we do um, we we did response trapping last year to a couple detections where we um, found uh, in one case somebody found a molt and in another case the sea grant crew volunteer crew caught some in their traps and we were able to follow up with some really intensive trapping to look for um, higher infestations. And in both cases, um, we found uh, a few more, but not a lot more, which was a big relief to us. Um, so I think that that model is, is, is great, is really helpful for um, doing intensive trapping when you do catch something. And then, you know, if, if that intensive trapping suggests that there isn't a lot, then that, that gives you the, the um, the ability to step back and, and shift those crews to other places where they, they might be better used. Thanks, Roger. Lawrence, you want to add anything to for Dungeness? Sure. So for us, you know, it's been an adaptive management um, in the upswing, and now we're going to go down into the downswing side a little bit. Um, is the capacity increased at the beginning? With our volunteers and, and funding that we were able to get through grants, uh, at this point, we're going to use those volunteers, hopefully, uh, in a slightly different capacity and give them some other uh, responsibilities. Um, I did not apply for a grant this year for the green crabs specifically, 
And so uh, one of our sites last two years, uh, no green crab that had green crab. And um, so in that situation, it's you know just going to the monthly monitoring, but in that main channel where we've caught you know, the last two years, 11, uh, we're gonna reduce the crab trapping number of days as well as traps but we'll still be out there um you know it's not something we're going to be able to walk away from so thanks florence neil do you want to give anything about your efforts out there and uh, swim yeah sure thanks alan um yeah kind of a sim similar kind of to what roger and and my my model for what i how i want it to go is actually how how lawrence and the, and the um from my life service have done out on the spit which is so we've had a you know, one or two detections in a couple of years. And then this last year we caught, we caught one. And typically what we do is that big response trapping. And in the past we haven't found any more. And then last year we found another one the next day. And then, you know, a couple more the next week, we actually saw some in the channel we were trapping um, or one in the channel we were trapping now. Um, and the, by the end of the year, we caught about, we caught 16 at the south end of Swim Bay and sort of three distinct areas and salt marshes. Um, but I think, you know, I just had this conversation with, with our technicians today that we're just going to have to do regular trapping this year. And I think April and May is going to really kind of dictate the rest of the season. Um, we do have a Clallam County Marine Resources Committee intern that will help us in the summer. And I've got more technician help. But it's sort of like, did you know how did you know how did we do a little bit? You know how big of a problem is this? It's hard to know just from one season, um, sort of the tail end of a season, as it, as it were. So, um, and the other huge thing for us was having the fish and wildlife crew come out and really blanket area the the areas that we're trapping, and then and then kind of look in all these little nooks and crannies where we did find somewhere I wasn't expecting it. Um, it was a huge help. Um, so. Yeah, that's that's um, something similar this year. Well, at least this year we'll start the game. So, thanks, Emily. I see you've got your hand up, and then after Emily, I, I want to give you know Bill. If you would like to share any information on work that you're managing, or Allie, um, just given that you were presenters earlier but are on the panel now, if there's additional um, information that you'd like to share about green crappers green crab response that you're managing. I want to give you the opportunity, but Emily, you had your hand up. Yeah, and, and I'm also happy to um, sort of seed to Bill and, and Allie and others um, as well. But I, I think my thinking at a, at a regional level in response to um, in response to Josh's question is really, you know, my answer is that sort of like on a from a scientific perspective, there are no that we, we don't know the sort of um, the relationship between population size and population growth rate, which is which is really at the heart of this question of when when do you stop trapping? Um, this this idea of thresholds. Um, thresholds can be assigned. Sean introduced some information based on like we want to keep impacts below a certain level, so that's that's our threshold. Thresholds could also be assigned based on we want to trap the population low enough so that the population growth rate is very low, and therefore we're we're like we're actually reducing the population rather than trapping the population low and it keeps going back up. And it's because the, we've trapped it to a level where it's actually growth capacity is still quite high. Um, I think those numbers are super important though, because um, you know we, you hear folks, uh, you know, Neil and, and Roger and, and Lawrence talking about on the ground experience and making decisions. Um, and the, the what you know what I hear a lot and and this is entirely true of my own experience out there too is there's not a lot of green crabs here or there are a lot here and so this this idea of like what is a lot is going to depend on your previous experience and I'm I'm going to guess that you know to to, to Josh Temple um, 16 green crabs is not a, is not a lot when he pulled 72,000 out of out of clay quite right so so he might see 16 and be like oh thank God. Um, and, and we might see 16 and be like, this is, this is a real problem. So I think understanding some of those dynamics of how population size relates to population growth potential will help us set thresholds. And we don't know that yet. It's likely site dependent. Um, and then the other lens on that, of course, is 
um, we ca we use traps and catch per unit effort to as a proxy for population size, but we don't know the relationship between population size and catch rate, um, which will vary by trap type. And so these are some of the basic questions that are really um, important to answer to, to, to build out a, a, an informed management plan. Thank you so much. Allie or Bill, would you like to jump in with some information on your programs? Sure, yeah, I actually just wanted to sort of follow up with what Emily was saying about how different trap types can lead to different um, catch rates and efforts. And um, I think in Curate and Harbors, that, that's where I spend most of my efforts on. We have a, a really just a good example of um, just using minnows and fukuis versus using shrimp traps in our catch rate differences. When we use just minnows and fukuis, we had a catch rate of about 2.5 crabs per every 100 trap set. When we used shrimp traps, we ended up getting 76 for every um, trap set. And so that's a huge difference and something that, you know, in Drayton Harbor, we've really started to consider how effective different traps are. And um, yeah, it really goes just back to what Emily was saying about that. And something I think that is pretty useful information for, you know, other people across the Salish Sea, how different we, we didn't even set that many shrimp traps. Honestly, we ended up setting about 70 shrimp traps um, towards the end of the season. And caught over 60 green crabs in those. So it was really effective for us to do that. Um, and yeah, I think just a little bit more about what's happening in Drayton Harbor. I think we, we've got a bit of a more unique situation in that Drayton Harbor has a lot of private land ownership compared to some of the other places that are um, doing a lot of trapping. And so we have that to contend with as well and trying to make sure that we're able to cover as many areas as we can get to and make sure we're not missing any spots where there's a lot of green crab activity. But we also have to make sure that we're you know, working with all of the various private landowners and um, other just government ownership. Um, and that, that idea also extends just throughout Whatcom County. We're starting to see some Green crabs found just, you know, one, one to five in the Birch Bay area, which has, again, the entire thing is shoreline and a lot of the tidelands are owned by a lot of different entities and private landowners. And again, in Bellingham Bay, which, you know, there's a, obviously a lot of people in that area that we'd have to, to work with. And so that's something that I think is pretty unique to our situation. Um, that we're trying to work out as well. Ali, I want to turn it over to Bill really quick in case he has information he'd like to share, but then I'd like to bring it back to you and Emily. Uh, there's a great question about the role of citizen science in green crab monitoring going forward. And I know that Northwest Straits and Washington Sea Grant have been some doing some work in that realm. Bill, any information you'd like to share? Yeah, sure, thank you. So uh, our work has been focused in Samish Bay. Uh, we're Myself and my son have uh, tried to keep about 15 or 16 shrimp pots out for the summer, checking them periodically. But it's, you know, I'm kind of curious to talk about uh, the issue that Allie raised, and I know Emily has struggled with this as well to figure out catch per unit effort in comparison to the shrimp and pukui, because I think anybody using the shrimp pots has seen how much more effective they are. And if we're interested in doing control trapping like they're doing in Lummi Pond or you know, what our efforts are gonna be focused on in Samish Bay is that you, you wanna be using the most effective gear to do it. You don't wanna be wasting your time with a pot that's got a, a low catch per unit effort, even though you're trying to collect data and be consistent to make that catch per unit effort uh, calculation. Uh, you know, I think we should all be trying to be as effective as possible to control them and using the, the best tool to do that. So interested in, in having more discussion around that. Uh, Samish has you know, seen a similar level uh, the past two summers uh, where we've caught you know, over the two years about 200, just under 200 crab. Some of those have been observational by our crews out working in the shellfish beds. The majority have been in the shrimp pots though. 
Thank you. Any follow up on that before we switch gears to citizen science or community science? I was Neil? just going to say oh. a comment. Um, yeah, so I was just going to say too, in terms of cash for unit effort, this is a larger conversation that a lot of the independent trapping partners and management, everyone are uh, trying to convene on more often to kind of, you know, get ahead of that before we get too far into the different strategies and trapping and, you know, trying to come up with a plan for comparing across sites, because I think that that's something that's important too, especially when you're talking about the different trap types. There are areas where shrimp pots are not supposed, probably should not be placed because you're going to get a lot of mortality by catch in those flats that are, you know, if Roger was pulling, putting out um, shrimp pots at Padilla Bay, probably going to kill a lot of stuff. If uh, you know you have a channel that stays inundated, it's probably more likely to put a shrimp pot there. You're going to have a better uh, survivability of things, so you're going to be able to utilize that. And so I think that that's a big question for us moving forward: is how do we utilize these different traps and do a systematic trapping program so that way we can compare across the platform between these different water bodies to know what maybe how thresholds kind of come into play with that. And so that's just something that I think that it's important to keep in mind, especially you know. Uh, I've been to a lot of different water bodies around the state, and I know that there are, you know, a lot of us have, and just, it's so unique out there, and you never really know the site that you're going to get handed to you, so it's kind of important to keep that in mind. That actually was was kind of my, I was going to have a, I had a question for Bill and, and Bobby to some extent too, which is kind of how long are you leaving the shrimp pots out for, and, and Bill, are those in intertidal, like lower, lower intertidal areas, or? Are they it's mostly mid to upper, Neil? Okay. We, um, when we move low, then we get the bycatch. We get the get the juvenile dungies and and uh, cancer gracilis. But if we stay mid to upper, is you know less bycatch. And as far as soak time goes, you know we're we're busy on the shellfish farm. That's why we've gone with the shrimp pots is because at low tide we're working. Mm -hmm. But at high tide we've got some extra time and we got boats available where we can typically get out and check the pots, rebate them. Maybe not every day. Sometimes they'll soak for several days. Sometimes we may not get to them for a couple of weeks. And every when that happens, if there's a crab in there, it's a green crab. Somehow they hmm. they survive in there and do just fine uh, over time. Yeah, that was going to be my question. I, I I think Bobby, you mentioned it earlier too. Just kind of like, you know, we have a couple of tidal channels I know don't run dry, and I've and I've done a couple of night soaks this winter. But you know, pull them out. Just thinking, uh, you know, I don't want to leave it in there and have you know, something crawl in there and die and, and kind of have a bycatch uh, sort of mortality sink out in a out in an estuary. But um, and also just figuring it's not and, and maybe I'm wrong on this, that it's not fishing if it doesn't have bait in it after a couple of days. Well, um, interesting about that, Neil, is we have left traps unbaited over the weekends earlier in our season and had crab in them the following Monday. So traps can still catch crab even if they're unbaited. Um, and I think that has to do with them seeking refuge. I mean, that's what we yeah. were observing with the females this winter is they were hunkering down in our traps because they thought they were a safe place. And for the most part, they were until we checked them, right? Um, so yeah, there's, um, uh, I think, I'm, I'm very interested in starting to utilize shrimp traps for the prospect trapping um, because they are so effective and they do catch a, ver a quite a wide range of um, sizes of green crab. Uh, um, there's, I, I see there's a question in the, in, about actually that, uh, the different size classes, but um, yeah. And then leaving the shrimp traps out, you know, we, we have the semi permanent array of shrimp traps in the sea pond that have been in there all winter. Um, they do get damaged um, from some intense weather and being uh, uh, hung up on the wall, the rock wall. Uh, we had some ice in the sea pond this during that, that cold snap back in December, which um, also damages them. So there is risk with leaving them out for an extended period of time. They do get some growth on them yada, yada. Um, so yeah, there, there's some risk there. Um, I have been impressed though with the majority of them holding up 
um, through this winter. It's been pretty minor um, fixes, I think, um, although they take some time with the number of traps we have in the sea pond. Um, so one thing I'll add, you know, I talked in my presentation about how we're planning to build our own shrimp traps, which I'm I'm pretty excited about because we've been able to source some uh, steel mesh um, from a company that um, uh, it's the steel mesh, but the it's fused with zinc. Um, which has been proven to help slow the degradation of steel. Um, and then it's also PVC coated. So it's like a rein reinforced. Um, uh, so the longevity is a lot better. So I'm hoping with that design, you know, we could be building traps that are going to be lasting, even doing even better than the, the vinyl coated ones from the Promar recreational shrimp traps. Before we jump to community science, is there any any additional information that you all would like to share about the effectiveness of different different trap types? We saw um, Teresa from U.S. Fish had asked about um, different trap types that may be more effective for catching different size clash classes of green crab, including young of the year. And then Josh from up in BC also noted that they use commercial style prawn traps up there that are very effective. We just want to see if there's anything else about trap types or bait that you'd like to share before we transition. Um, I'll I'll just provide a, a few thoughts as well. And and you know the 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 as people who are going after catching crabs, it's not uncommon for our conversation to to sort of take a detour into who's got the best bait, who's got the best gear, and the best uh, the best combination. Um, it's definitely where a lot of trappers, you know, that's where our brains go naturally. Um, I think you know, I think the the key here is 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 a lot about understanding how different traps work differently. And as as Teresa's question really gets at we do know that there are some life stages of crabs that are not captured with certain trap types. Um, and we know that certain trap types that allow more of the larger crabs are less inviting to the very small crabs that we also wanna remove. So I think all of these, the key here is understanding that each trap type has advantages. Um, and yeah, I, I think we heard Alan talk about um, you know, you can pack 15 traps, uh, 15 fukuis on your back, but four shrimp traps. Uh, so thinking about how we allocate effort across those is really important. And to Bill's point about, um, you know, wanting to use the most effective tool um, for, for removal, that's, that's absolutely true. And I think in cases where we do move towards removal, it absolutely makes, makes sense to use shrimp traps in, a, in appropriate spots. The, the Lummi Sea Pond is like the perfect place in the world to use shrimp, tra shrimp traps for long-term deployment. Um, and I, I also can see a role for uh, collecting data periodically, not on a consistent level, but periodically sort of like taking the temperature of a site with standardized trapping methods that go back to the, the trap types that um, have been used for the longest the, the longest period. That's sort of like sort of dipping a little bit of pH paper in something periodically to check the status of what's going on. So we're not necessarily, um, you know, doing all of one thing, but we have both the information we need to track the progress of removal efforts, as well as um, investing uh, effort in efficient removal as well where, where we can. Thank you. Alan, I see you've got your hand up. Yeah. Um... So this all comes back into the CPUE. You know, the, one of the questions is, well, if CPUE is going up or it's going down, why? Is that because you're using a different trap type? Is that because, you know, it's a different part of the season? It, there's a lot of different things that go into that. So CPUE, again, is, is, is a metrics we use, but it has, it's still pretty rough. And the other thing, um, you know, that we're looking at is, as Bobby said, you know, they didn't start using the shrimp top uh, shrimp traps until this year. It's only it's only been a year since shrimp traps sort of became oh we're we're this is the great this is the great thing and we're going to be using it more and more and we're we've ordered a whole bunch of them, but we could be finding new traps that are going to be more effective. But every time you find a new trap, there's a, there's part of the consistency. There's part of like how it's going to be deployed. It's going to be uh you know there's there's a lot of different pieces with it. So there's there's give and take whenever you're you're changing uh, tools, but we are always looking at what's going to build build a better trap. 
Um, I know up in Canada, they're talk they're using some uh, covering on the traps, so maybe making it better uh, cover or habitat that could attract more females. You know, is that an, another technique that you can use to bring in more crabs? But every time you do that, anecdotally, you might say, "Wow, it just created." You know, we've caught a whole bunch more trap uh, crabs this way, and everybody picks it up. But it was a very localized effect. So once you, you know, if you want to know what's the best trap, it takes some research and study because you could be putting a lot of effort into it and you find out it was just, it really didn't, wasn't a better trap and you put a lot of effort into that. So there's a lot of give and take, but I think the shrimp, uh, the shrimp traps have proven to be very effective um, and uh, that's, that's really good. So we're always innovating, adaptive management, um, looking for the better trap every day. So thanks. Thank you, Alan. And just in the interest of time, really trying to wrap up by five o'clock just to respect everyone's schedules. I want to end on that question about getting folks involved through community science. But really quick, before we jump to that, there was a question about what time of year were you catching gravid females and how many did you catch? So maybe Bobby, what type of year were you catching the females with eggs? Yeah, they didn't really start popping up in um, more numbers until October and November. Um, uh, so it was really late, late fall. And um, we found quite a bit of them in January after the traps had been soaking for quite a while. So um, it's variable, but winter time definitely does seem to be um, when they're more catchable. Thank you. So I wanna turn it over to Ali and Emily or anyone else that is coordinating community science efforts related to green crabs. But before I do that, if you have additional questions that we didn't get to, please feel free to email Emily or email Chelsea or myself or Emily, I'm sure she could help respond to those too. Um, but feel free to email Chelsea or myself and we'll be sure to get an answer to you. Um, community science, anything that you have planned for the year or you see that may change now that we're under an emergency order and a, a little bit of a different green crab environment than we were a year ago? All right, I guess I'll start off. Um, yeah, so with the Northwest Straits Commission, we're working closely with the Wacom Marine Resources Committee and uh, Skagit Marine Resources Committee to just use their manpower to really get out there. Um, we're, we're trying to implement a volunteer program to help with all of the removal efforts in Drayton Harbor. Um, I said the commission are also going to be helping with removal efforts in Samish Bay as well. And so just trying to get enough people to help in those areas. Um, we've also wanted to enlist um, community member help for the outreach aspect. Uh, we had a really successful um, outreach event in Drayton Harbor um, this past season where we sent mailers out to a thousand landowners in the area to just give them information on what green crabs look like, what to do, how to report it, um, how to get involved. And we got quite a few responses from, from those types of efforts. And so that at, at the commission, we're really working closely with those MRCs to continue those types of outreach and then the on the, on the ground um, boots in the mud efforts. And Emily, I'm sure you've got. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, our, so the, the CRAB team early detection network is at its core a citizen science model where we work with, with volunteers and partners um, across a network of sites. Um, the, the, I, it's, you know, we started in 2015 with seven sites and two months of sampling and gee, look at us now. Um, and uh, it's been, it's, it's just been the result of really enthusiastic, sustained support. Some of the folks who um, are with us have been with us since day one, since our very first training workshop, and they've never missed a month of sampling. And, and that commitment and that sort of sustained interest is is amazingly critical to 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 not only the efforts of um, going out there and trapping um, consistently, but also to bringing voice and awareness uh, of the issue to 
lots of different groups. This is, you know, 150 ambassadors who are incredibly um, well educated on green crab issues. Um, they've, you know, been learning with us alongside us since 2015 and participate in a win winter seminar series that shares results with them of our eDNA work and of the genetics work. So they're they're really on the front lines and they're right there with all of us. Um, and they are people who are engaged in their communities in lots of different ways. So it's it's been an incredibly valuable groundswell um, for the issue in the state. These are folks who are you know connected through MRCs, um, through other sort of um, other professional and um, volunteer connections. They're connected to 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 their beaches, to their neighbors, um, and because of them, you know, I would I would venture that there's a, a whole lot of awareness in the state um, that you know I the folks here didn't even have to raise ourselves, <laughs> but they, they, they helped us do that. And um, so it's, I, I think the citizen science model is, you know, Roger made a, um, a comment about, about free labor. I guess I wouldn't, I might, I think Roger was being very generous and humble about his contributions because I know it takes a lot of effort to, um, to manage intern and, and volunteer labor. Um, and so I, you know, I want to recognize that folks who do work with with these groups, it's a huge bang for your buck, and it it also um, is worth investing a fair a fair amount in because of the scope of of um, of who you can reach. Well, we're at five o'clock. I see Carl's got his hand up, and I just want to, you know, give an open mic if there's any final concluding thoughts that you all want to share. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Thank you all to our panelists. Carl, do you want to give it just a minute? Yeah, you bet. I I just um, I just kind of wanted to qualify uh, some of Lummi's uh, uh, proposed efforts for the coming season. Our from the get go, um, we have intended to engage our community at uh, multiple levels, uh, be it school age children all the way up to commercial fishers. Uh, Lummi is a fishing community, a good part of the income on reservation, it comes from fishing, and uh, with that comes a, a certain part of the community that are very skilled, and so in terms of uh, the Lummi Nation contracting with, possibly contracting with some of our Lummi fishers, um, it, it really, I, 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 di I didn't want to leave the impression that Lummi is kind of flying in the face of uh, kind of the, the larger statewide effort to, um, um, you know, to allow commercial fishing. It really is, uh, that is not the case. This is more an effort of, of a, um, a way to streamline the logistics of, of you know, procuring bait, um, you know, processing the traps and, and, and then the waste exposure, or the, sorry, the waste disposal. And, um, you know, utilizing these skilled hands uh, in the community, uh, you know, with using these fishermen, it's just a, it's a very natural fit that way. Um, and our fishers would be, you know, basically following our, our directions and uh, fitting into the larger trapping, you know, scheme for the sea pond. Um, so I did, I just wanted to kind of qualify that from uh, earlier on in the, the meeting today. And, um, and just, uh, yeah, we hope, you know, Bobby and I both, uh, you know, hope to engage the community, the pandemic definitely threw a, you know, spanner in the works of, of every, uh, you know, effort we had uh, planned for that. So we hope to, as the pandemic allows, to um, re-engage that way. All right, thank you. Any final concluding thoughts before we log off? All right. Well, thank you all. Thanks to our panelists. Thanks for everyone for tuning in. We'll get this recording up on WDFW's YouTube later this week. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to shoot Chelsea or I an email. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody.